Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us at the uh, Joint Committee meeting for Public Safety and Education and Culture. Um, we're going to have two items on our agenda today. The first is the CEO Program and Restorative Justice, and the second is Bus Safety. To prove that this is um, truly a uh, co-meeting, co, um, I'm going to do the beginning, the CEO Program, and uh, Chair Juwando will be doing the bus safety program. I have a feeling that both of us will interrupt each other. Um, but as we begin, uh, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence. This is the fifth year anniversary of the killing of Jalen Rose Willie uh, from Great Mills High School in St. Mary's County, Maryland. It's hard to believe it's already been five years. So I'd like to ask for a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Um, the, what I'm going to do is I will ask uh, the uh, Chair Jawando for opening comments on this topic uh, and also ask all committee members for opening comments. Obviously, school safety is an utmost concern for all of us. And uh, I, just to remind people of what happened and what didn't happen for, uh, for this topic, there was legislation, there was two pieces of legislation uh, way back when to have changes that were then called school resource officers to uh, CEOs, SROs to CEOs, uh, community engagement officers. Um, we uh, did not pass either legis legislative initiative. Uh, Councilmember Jawando uh, was, uh, he and, and uh, uh, others, were, were in, and had one piece of the legislation. Uh, I was involved with the other piece of the legislation, and uh, neither one ever came to a vote. The county executive came in and changed the, C, the SROs to CEOs without legislation, and that's where we are at this point. Um, everyone certainly wants to make certain that, that our children are safe at all times, especially in our schools, and we've had some, some horrible incidents in and or near our schools over, over the last uh, time. Um, and there's going to be a series of six discussion issues in our packet. And it would be uh, uh, helpful to know what is and isn't working as, it, as it's planned. And as we begin, I wanted to thank Ms. McGuire and Ms. Farag for doing, once again, doing an excellent packet for, for the committees. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Chawando. Chair, if you want to like this or that. Thank you, Chair Katz, and good morning to everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, agree with all of your comments and appreciate the history. Um, two of our colleagues that were co-sponsors of those bills are no longer with us, Council Members Rice and, and Council right. Member Reamer. Um, but I, I couldn't agree with you more that we all agree that all of our kids need to be safe, and all of our faculty and staff need to be safe in their schools. Um, I've just recently started as chair of the Education and Culture Committee, and I started doing a tour of all the 25 clusters and was, have made it to three so far, um, and have seen the CEO program uh, in its current iteration, uh, working in various ways depending on the high school that, uh, or the school that I was at. Uh, so it'll be good to get an update um, on the data and on where things are, and uh, as we said, we would uh, when it went into effect. So. Uh, appreciate all the folks that are going to be here and look forward to the discussion and the questions. And as we begin, I'm going to ask the committee members if they would like to add anything. I think it should be noted there's three people on each committee, and, mm -hmm. and uh, if you've counted, there's only five of us here because uh, Council Member Mink actually wears two hats. She's on both committees, so, so uh, uh, that doesn't mean she gets to speak any longer. That just means <laughs> she wears, I hear you. Uh, anyhow, does anybody on the committee want to have any opening statements? If not, we're going to turn to... Yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just briefly, um, you know, as some of you, actually quite a few of you sitting in the audience uh, know, uh, the Safe to Learn Act and its, um, its coming to life in 2018 was near and dear to me, as it was to Director Clark sitting in the back of the room, um, and something I worked on very diligently um, when Montgomery County uh, made the change to call SROs, CEOs, um, 
and remove them from the schools. It was the only county in the state of Maryland to do so right at the time when students were coming back to school in person after experiencing the trauma of the COVID-19 pandemic and the virtual learning environment. And I need to be clear because um, no matter what Montgomery County calls them, under state law, they are still SROs. And no matter what the county calls them, they cannot change the way the state statute defines an SRO. And I think that's really important um, because we as a local jurisdiction are limited and preempted from certain things that exist in state law. We cannot be um, less restrictive or, 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 or do less than what the state requires. Um, so I hope that frames our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Member Thanks, so I have been anticipating and looking forward to this discussion um, because obviously, uh, as everyone has stated and we all know, there is nothing more important uh, than the safety and security of our kids. So the numbers that are on this data jump off this, just jump off the screen. They're sobering, um, to say the least. And, but they don't tell the whole story. Uh, it's important to note that there are tremendous efforts being made in addition to law enforcement and security officials to address the issues that we're seeing in the schools, but there are a number of other organizations that are trying their best to support our children and youth in a variety of other ways. What's clear um, is that more needs to be done and I look forward to digging into this data, acknowledging again that it doesn't tell the complete story. And we need to be open to all and every solution that's out there. As Councilmember Jawando noted, all of us have heard from parents, from students, from faculty, from staff, from these schools, who in numerous instances have reported feeling unsafe. And that's unacceptable. So I, we're going to have this session today, but this is by no means the end of this conversation. Um, this will continue to be an evolution as we respond to the situation that's on the ground that has been uh, described in the numbers that we see here today. So thank you to both chairs for calling this session together, and we look forward to working collaboratively uh, to see what we can do to make sure that our kids feel safe. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. Thank you, I appreciate everybody being here today. I'm just gonna note that um, as, we'll, as we'll discuss, as, as today unfolds, we have a lot of different tools in our toolkit um, from the CEO program, we have uh, restorative justice programs, we have a, a number of different mental health programs, um, and uh, we've been very focused in the Education and Culture Committee on data and um, being driven by results uh, I just want to acknowledge that, as has been said, we're all here for the same reason. We all want the best um, for our kids and for our community. Uh, so I, I look forward to really digging into the data and the results and seeing where is the best use of our resources and our time uh, and letting that help uh, guide us forward. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we should be noted, and we're actually going to turn to the uh, to go through this packet. But there is not going to be a vote today. There has not been a vote. There's not going to be a vote today. This is an update on what has and what hasn't happened. So with that, uh, let me turn to the, to the people that actually did this packet. And anyone who's associated with, the, with the, uh, this topic, if you want to come and sit at the panel. If not, we'll ask questions as we, as we uh, go through. But uh, people from the... Uh, from this uh, MCPS, from the police, whoever would, would please come up and sit with us. And with that, I don't know who's gonna, who's gonna lead this off, but somebody needs to lead this off. Good morning, everybody. Um, the two chairs and the council members have all hit on the salient points of why you're having this briefing today. I just wanted to note a couple of data sets within the staff report. Um, just for your reference on page six, there are various data sets for restorative justice policy. Uh, implementation, including the number of service events so far this year. It includes data on wellness referrals, um, either to a social worker or the Bridge to Wellness Wellness Center. There's also information on suspension rates, um, and MCPS has also provided additional data on students have received services, and this is broken out by demographics, reasons of services, grade level, and the types of student referrals. 
In terms of CEO data on pages three through five, there are data sets on total school service calls and incident reports, including a breakdown by high school, as well as arrests, citations, and referrals to DJS, Department of Juvenile Services. Um, additionally, the staff report contains information on total bias incidents in schools on page five. There's also information regarding CEO demographics, school assignments, selection criteria, and training in the attachments. And MCPS has a presentation for you that we're happy to turn over to them. Okay, please, welcome. You know, if I could ask the panel to please introduce themselves so that the public is aware, that, uh, that, as we are, uh, who, 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 was, who was being kind enough to join us. Good morning, uh, my name is Chris Debris. I'm the Director of Automated Traffic Enforcement with the Montgomery County Police Department. Good morning, Brian Delma. I'm the captain and oversee the Traffic Operations Division. Good morning, Kevin Parker. I'm a lieutenant, Community Engagement Division. Assistant Chief Mark Yamada, uh, Chief of the Field Services Bureau. Good morning. I am Dana Edwards. I'm the Chief of District Operations. I work directly with our Safety and Security Department in, MC in Montgomery County Public Schools. Good morning. I'm Brian Hull. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Montgomery County Public Schools, and we have several other um, MCPS leaders here, and we will kind of rotate through as we move through the topics well, this morning. And, and I appreciate that. If the, the traffic group, which is the second group, it's it's rare that I ask the police to please take a step back here, but if and if you could change those seats with uh, people from MCPS or whoever's directly involved in this, believe me, we'll call you back for not... We're not telling you to, we want you to stay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll do some musical chairs. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah musical yeah. chairs are, are the fun part of this job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right, please. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, so thank you and good morning, uh, Chair Katz, Chair Duando, uh, members of the Public Safety and Education and Culture Committee. Um, as I said, my name is Brian Hall. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Montgomery County Public Schools. So as we all know, safety and well-being of our students is a top priority in our work and is essential uh, that we work together to create a safe learning environment for our staff and our students. This work cannot be done alone and we rely on the collaboration with our partner agencies, families, community groups, and the County Council to advance our work around safety and well-being. We appreciate the opportunity to share with you today our collaborative efforts within the school system and with our agency partners and look forward to discussing our plans for enhancing school safety in the county. Next slide, please. Uh, so we are pleased to share today our overall approach to well-being that, as you can see from the slide, has uh, several different components that we have highlighted. So there's the physical safety and the infrastructure. Uh, which would include our access camera systems, safety vestibules and the entrances to our schools, key fobs and key systems, and integrated technology uh, in our buildings, including camera systems and building alarms that can be monitored on site as well as from central office. Secondly, in our investment to personnel over the past few years, we have introduced security rovers at the elementary school level, added additional security uh, cluster security coordinators, and added a dedicated training coordinator to assist with standardizing practices and procedures across all of our locations. <clears throat> we are pleased to continue to work uh, in partnership with our uh, MCD, MCPD partners on the CEO 2.0 program and District Patrol and Command. Uh, momentarily, you will hear from our school uh, schools team that supports directly supports student well-being. They will speak to the tremendous importance of the restorative approaches in our schools, communities, both as a proactive measure and as a responsive and in a responsive manner. We remain committed to training and professional learning for emergency preparedness and school security staff and all staff within our schools. We are very aware that incidences that occur in our communities impact our schools and likewise incidents that uh, occur in our schools impact our community. So this just highlights the importance of our partnerships and collaborations with DHHS, law enforcement, and fire and rescue. We grow and work together in multi-agencies meetings, trainings, and um, res uh, response opportunities. So I'm glad to be joined here uh, by several members of our MCPS team. Uh, and today, as uh, was mentioned earlier, we will discuss a couple of topics, the restorative justice and well-being, 
and school safety and support in the, in the first presentation here. We will also provide an update on hate bias incidents and our ongoing work, training, and collaboration with our agency partners. Finally, we will highlight MCPS is what, what MCPS is currently implementing for overall well-being and safety. So I'll now turn it over to Associate Superintendent Damon Monteleone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hall, and, and greetings, council members, and thanks for having us back. Um, as Mr. Hall said, I'm Damon Monteleone, one of the Associate Superintendents of School Support and Wellbeing. And I wanted to start off um, just by saying that we believe it's important to share an overview, uh, really, of, of what restorative justice is in Montgomery County Public Schools, so everybody is operating from the same fundamental understanding. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, while many will associate or may associate uh, restorative justice with school discipline and an alternative response to school discipline, it really is so much more than that. It is so much greater than that. Uh, the primary function of restorative justice or restorative approaches is to build stronger school cultures and climate, fundamentally and primarily. Additionally, we know restorative approaches are used in e every day in, in settings throughout schools, often with counselors and teachers as they engage with students. For example, a teacher de-escalating de a situation in the second grade class, uh, a teacher having a reflective conversation with two students who may have gotten into an argument. These are restorative approaches, and they have been used, and they are used every single day in our schools. Um, it is not a curriculum. It is not a defined program. It is not something that we are infusing into classrooms uh, uh, monolithically. All right. Um, it really is an approach. It's a philosophy about how our school system wants to address climate and relationship building that we know is critical for our students, even more so now as we've come out of the pandemic. Um, specifically, it's a set of practices that allows all members of a community to engage in and problem solve physical, social, psychological, and disciplinary issues that affect students and the community at large and take responsibility for their actions and work with those impacted to restore the community and those members who are harmed as a result of those actions. Restorative justice in MCPS takes all of us. It is not centered with any stakeholder group or any one individual or individuals in schools. We know the engagement and partnership of our administrators, teachers, staff, and students is significant. And moreover, we need our parents and our community members as part of this approach. Restorative approaches or justice are merely one of a variety of building blocks that we are currently utilizing in MCPS to foster learning environments that are, are rooted in equity and well-being. Other key and fundal, uh, fundamental elements that I've, I've been here before you to share include our student well-being teams, the Bridge to Wellness programs, the inclusion of our social workers, the trauma-informed and equity-centered approach to teaching and learning that we are, are building capacity of our teachers to employ in each of our classrooms, because we know that well-being is a prerequisite for safety and it's a prerequisite for academic success. So at this point, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Ms. Shauna K. Ramby, Director of Social, Emotional, Behavior, Health, and Academics. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shauna K. Ramby. I'm the Director of Student Engagement, Behavior, Health. Um, that's a rather long title to say that um, I support our, the implementation of our 40 well-being social workers, the new implementation of our Bridge to Wellness program, as well as alternative schools and restorative justice. Um, Mr. Montalini did such an excellent job of explaining um, restorative justice. Uh, most of what we do in restorative justice focuses on the preventative, and you'll hear that over and over again. You'll hear words like connection and relationship. But I want to take us back a little bit. So Maryland House Bill 725, which took effect on July 1st, 2019, requires all of our Maryland school systems, discipline regulations to provide for restorative approaches, trauma-informed practices. The bill states that the primary purpose of, the, of a disciplinary measure and any disciplinary measure is to be rehabilitative, restorative, and educational. HB 725 requires four things, that methods be primarily proactive and preventative, that methods emphasize on relationships and expectations, um, that there is accountable responses to the harm that's occurred, and that there must be focus on how to repair relationships. The aim of strong restorative school districts and cultures are to focus 80 to 90 percent of their efforts on what we call tier one supports or preventative measures. You'll also see this in an MTSS, the multi-tiered system of supports. We know that 
15% of our students are going to require more intensive measures at Tier 2, and 5% of our students are going to require more intensive support at Tier 1. And this is where some of those other measures, as mentioned, as our social workers, direct services come into place. If you take a look at the chart in front of you, it shows the responses of our RJ specialists this year. So restorative justice specialists, of which there are nine for the first time this school year, serve the entire system. Um, as you might remember, in previous years, there have only been three specialists to implement this work across 210 schools. So we're really excited about being able to elevate the implementation of this work with, um, with support. In semester one, there are over 1,100 calls for service from within our county from our specialists. Those were 103 schools that called for service outside of what is regularly offered. As you can see, most of the service is in consultation, professional development, goal setting for schools, and more. Um, as you can see, appropriately, only about 7% of those services are provided for mediation or response to an event. And about 3% of those services, and we'd like to see that higher in the future, are around parent engagement and support, which is an area that we know that we need to build out on in order to get our parents' supports within our school and understanding how to make a truly restorative environment. Um, it is important to make this work local. Um, we've discovered that the biggest effect that we've had has been on schools who are most often served by a specialist, and we have 11 of our schools that are served by a specialist or mindful educator two days a week. In those schools, measures such as suspensions are down at 10 out of the 11. So we'd like to, to make sure that we take a look at that. Some of the important increases that have happened is that last year for the first time, our secondary schools, our middle and high schools, received a local RJ coach. This is not an individually staffed position, but rather a one-on-one, -on -one, um, it's a stipended position that teachers receive support with. Next slide, please. This year, our uh, elementary schools were given the same stipended positions also for the first time. So this is newly being implemented. The impact of restorative approaches can be challenging to measure, as many approaches center on preventing misconduct or conflict from ever happening. For example, we can share how many fights have happened or how many times a student has used disrespectful language. However, it's more difficult to measure how many times they have not. We can look to student surveys and school climate data to tell us about restorative aspects within a school. For example, when looking at relationships, one measure we can use is in examining how many students feel that they have a trusted adult or if students feel like they can get along with each other in spite of differences. One tangible data point is also school suspension. Montgomery County Public Schools consistently has had the lowest suspension rate in Maryland as reported by the Maryland State Department of Education with a suspension ratio of 1.5 in the year 2022. Suspensions have reduced by 38% in the last six years, and we know that suspensions most deeply affect our most underserved populations. This is due to policies focused on trauma-informed practices and applying restorative approaches to student behavior intervention. We must always acknowledge that we must continue to work on the disparities within our suspensions. We know that that is an area that we continue to struggle with. In order to better serve our students with higher levels of disproportionality, RJ specialists and grant-funded mindfulness educators are placed at those specific school sites. Some upgrades that our team has been working on include consents for more formal restorative interventions as they're required. For example, as a response to a large-scale student incident, and we are also increasing training around supporting our varied community groups. Restorative justice is a core aspect of ensuring the overall well-being of our students, and one area that has impacted us recently and has continued to impact our nation is hate bias. We are not immune to the rising issues of hate across our nation nor across our district. Mr. Greg Edmondson, the Director of Welfare and Compliance, will now take us through MCPS's response to hate bias. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all. My name is Greg Edmondson, Director of Student Welfare and Compliance. Incidents involving hate bias, we can go to the next slide, please. Incidents involving hate bias is a well-being focus 
area for our students and our school communities. Acts of incidents of hate bias are not tolerated in, in MCPS. These acts impede our longstanding progress um, towards creating, fostering, and promoting equity, inclusivity, and acceptance for all. This commitment is named and detailed in MCPS Board Policy ACA on non-discrimination, equity, and cultural proficiency. In 2020, specific protocols on, response, on responses to hate bias were developed and aligned with our policy and reporting structures on bullying, harassment, and intimidation. In 2021, the Board of Education added language involving incidents of hate bias into that policy. This current school year, as we all know, we've experienced a significant increase in our reports, primarily since January of 2023. Um, in February of 2023, we received 42 reports in our schools alone. Uh, these reports included racial discrimination, such as the use of, of the N-word, uh, religious and cultural discrimination around anti-Semitism, and discrimination against our LGBTQ plus community. In an effort to assess the situation, we met with key community stakeholders for feedback and input, including council members Ludke and Friedson. Thank you for your help with this. Um, new guidelines have been established recently um, in the format of a clearly articulated flowchart, which you received, um, and a new MCPS reporting form was developed um, to more specifically identify the details in the targeted groups. We also reestablished the communication expectations with our communities um, to include transparency around the incidents and resources available for support for our students and families. Uh, we re-emphasized our collaborative efforts with MCPD to contact our emergency communication center for all incidents of hate bias, regardless of scope and, and size. Our superintendent held a press conference stating our planned responses to these incidents, and we met with all of our principals and established a clear understanding of the work that was ahead of us. Our student code of conduct is currently being reviewed to ensure specific hate bias incidents are included in the disciplinary continuum. And an expectation was established to ensure parent guardian meetings are scheduled as part of a re-entry process for any of our um, incident offenders. All of these steps have been taken to ensure we are responsive as well as preventative in our efforts to ensure the well-being of our students and the community. I will now turn it over to Mrs. Dana Edwards to share more on aspects of our safety in our schools. Good morning and thank you for the transition time. Appreciate it. <clears throat> so I think one of the big things in, in which when we started this, we really, as, as the council has said, these are our schools, our students, and our responsibility. And when we say our, it's just not the staff of MCPS, but we take into account that we are working with students every day. Um, when I was a principal, it was one thing I would say to my parents every year that I want to send you home every day. This is my commitment to your parents uh, the same way you came in, except you'll be smarter. <laughs> and so in doing that, we recognize coming back from the pandemic, we know the year we had last year, and we really um, were met with many things that are an impact from the pandemic, from the social emotional aspect, coming back and really um, re-immersing ourselves in terms of how we do business within a brick and mortar setting. And so this last year happened, but it didn't happen. And so now we use this year as our opportunity to really format and use those as building blocks, but to work together to really determine when something needs to move forward, something needs to be attended to, or we need to put something else in. So there are a lot of us here today because it takes a lot of us to do the work. And so at the end of the table and even behind us are our partners every single day when we talk about proactive, when we talk about reactive, and when we talk about really building for the future. And so you've heard from our restorative uh, justice team, our well-being team, I would say, because it is not just about restorative practices. That is an act, that is a structure, but it's about the wrapping around and really considering of what that looks like for every single kid 
all the time. And we've put in a lot of different services to do that. What I will um, share with you, and Mr. Edmondson talked about hate bias, and we have seen an uptick. And we've looked at the clarity around it. And I do want to thank Council Member Lukey for meeting with us and talking about clarity, thinking about how our parents are directly involved in the conversation when something like this happens, and really maintaining and keeping the conversation going um, when it is at the forefront in terms of how we treat one another how we recognize differences, and how we honor those differences all at the same time. And so today, um, I will, as I shared earlier, I work directly with our safety and security department. And one of the things I want to talk to you about are serious incidents from this year, in addition to some of the things that we have been doing to address them now, but also being proactive as we start to plan um, into the future. What you will hear from me is a sense of collaboration because we don't know it all um, and we don't pretend to know it all, but we want to do this with others. So our administrators um, in our school buildings, they do report serious incidents that happen within their building. We are gonna take a look at some of those um, serious incidents that occur at an MCPS site or in connection with a school-related activity, i.e. possibly a football game, and I use that as an example. These incidents can include anywhere um, from a medical request, there's a student who may have been injured in PE class, they have to be transported, we're um, also discussing disruptions, assaults, and weapons. And so through March 19th, in terms of the, um, the presentation that was submitted to council, the pie chart that, I'm sorry, March 9th, the pie chart that's on the screen shows uh, the serious incidents that we have reported this year that in total of just under about 2,500. The pie chart focuses on five types of incidents that generally require additional internal or external support. Um, and so if you look at the largest chunk on the pie chart, there's about 53% that fall under the medical assistance category. Medical assistance, as I shared, um, can be a student who's gotten violently ill. Um, we need to call an ambulance for a student um, and or um, other situations, falls and injuries, and or the use of an EpiPen is also categorized. 19% of our incidents are designated as drugs or con controlled substances, and those events um, involve marijuana and or vaping. 14% of the designated are as weapons, and 3% of the incidents include an attack on an adult with half of those um, occurring with students with medical or known conditions, some of our students who may be in our more restrictive programs when that has actually happened. Nine percent of our incidents are designated as, as an attack on a student, and half of them um, occurred possibly, I'm sorry, I did not mean possibly, half of them occurred at the high school level in terms of any support that we may need. We do reach out to our CEO partners and or patrol to be able to support us. Our partners in MCPD have pr um, provided to the council specific data about the calls and services that they have come to our schools for, and they are a continuum of different areas that we talked about there. Our police partners have supported us throughout the year with many of the serious incidents that I just uh, discussed, whether they are big or small, because again, our work together is really critical and they have really been excellent partners for us. I know later in the presentation we will discuss bus safety, but I did want to highlight that 162 of our serious incidents did occur on our buses, but please know as of the submission of this, we have run about 148,000 routes back and forward to our schools to be able to support there. Um, at this time, we have not had any pedestrian incidents involving our buses for this school year. However, there have been other um, incidents that have happened um, close to our buses. If we go to the next slide. A highlight of our work, as I there's, shared uh, earlier, has been second, our, just, I'm sorry. There's some discussion on this. Mm -hmm. This period covers August 22 to March 9th, 23. Yes. That's how I read it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, just wanted to make clear for my colleagues here. 
Did I not say that? I, I think you did. Okay. All right. No worries. As of March 9th. Yeah, but that means. Oh, no. March. Not as of March. <laughs> Through not March. Through March 9th. Yes. Right. The data is as of March 9th. It did not all happen on March 9th. And I thank yeah. you for clarifying that. Yeah, I just want to be clear. <laughs> okay. I thought it meant from March 9th to, to this date. That's how I no. No, 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 no. No. That would have been a week. That would have been a week, yes. You received this report on March 9th. You received the report yeah. on March 9th. If it was from March 9th through today, we would be having a very different conversation. Yeah, so I do appreciate you highlighting it. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, um, I do want to talk about our public safety collaborations and partnership. And a true highlight of the work has really been around the partnerships. Um, this year has been critically important, as you talked about, the CEO 2.0 program. It is its inaugural year, so we wanted to be very attentive to the work that we really needed to do shoulder to shoulder um, with all of our partners. Not displayed here, but worth noting, is the support of the County Council and the County Executive in the development of the Bridge to Wellness Centers in all of our high schools. And this started at the beginning of the year, and we are certain of the significance and the difference that this has made. We continue to meet regularly with our DHHS and law enforcement partners, knowing well-being and safety is ongoing multi-agency work. And here we do want to highlight continued collaboration. We did start the summer in July with a summer safety summit that included um, our law enforcement partners as well as other county agencies, our allied law enforcement partners, fire and rescue. And we gather with our administrators and our security staff to begin the conversations to start the school year. That gave us an opportunity to be able to get on the same page, highlight the work that we wanted to do, and look at proactive training that we really wanted to take into account that supported any emergency preparedness that we would, um, we would in, encounter, as well as really knowing and understanding that some of the concerns that came out around the CEO 2.0 program and anything that we did for safety and security goes back to the conversation around the disproportionality um, of our students of color. And so we use this opportunity to be able to talk about how we were going to avoid that as much as possible, look at our communication, think about the restorative practices that we wanted to put into place, and how we would work together hand in hand um, as an entire community to do that. These same partners work with us not only to develop the athletic safety plan that started in the fall that we have um, taken through our football games as well as our spring sports to make sure that when students and families come to those events that those events are um, free of any activity or, um, and are safe places for people to come to. We do hold weekly meetings with Captain Satinsky and Lieutenant Parker as the Re-Envision CEO program has been implemented this year. And that has been very instrumental in making sure that the MOU is alive and making sure that we have our pulse point on the things that need to move forward. If you go to the next slide, our school-based security officers also um, go through several iterations of training, not only the, I call it the tactical level of training, the things they need to know for CPR and emergency preparedness, but they work with students. And that's critically important for us so that they understand our students, they understand cultural competence, and they're able to recognize and understand how they enter the space and how our students enter the space as well as to provide um, training around social emotional wellness because many of the situations that we are encountering are from a trauma-based perspective. In addition, our security staff, they also um, participate in the Maryland model for school resource officer training throughout the year so that they have that, um, that requirement under their belt as well. And so our commitment around the personnel is not just hiring the personnel, but making sure that the personnel can operate effectively within that space into the considerations of everything that goes into well-being. If we go to the next slide, finally what I just want to highlight are our current strategies and responses. The last two months, um, we have seen um, a lot of inquiries and concerns, and council highlighted that prior to the start of this presentation. Um, and I would say that some of this is no different than districts across the state of Maryland and or across the United States. 
However, this is our county. These are our schools, these are our students, and this is our responsibility. And so throughout this discussion, we've shared um, different ways and different places we've approached it. But at this point, we felt like it was very important to really put together a district-wide approach that would really have us focus on what we are doing right now um, to be able to close this year out and to address many of the things that are happening, but also the thought about how we go into summer and how we start next year so that all of these practices really become a part of who we are um, as a district. And so from January up until now, and I think this one is a little bit more linear in term, um, versus the pie graph that you saw, um, we have started to deploy additional staff to our schools, mainly our high schools, to really be able to support with the needs that they have. We've enhanced our communication and we shared some really strong safety messages from our superintendent. We've met with community members, um, our students, our staff members in different clusters to really hear their experiences and take those experiences and tailor our next steps. And we've developed a dedicated website that highlights information about our approach to safety and security that will change as we continue to move about um, the school year. We standardize our approach to what our security staff do in buildings so that we limit the variance. And so that when we know that um, our security staff will be in certain places within the building, work with our staff in certain ways and work with students, it creates, um, it, it creates a level of sameness across the district. It also creates a level of predictability. And we have had a focus on our restrooms in terms of monitoring protocols and procedures. And this week we will start our safety and well-being advisory group with students, staff, and families to really help us to continue the conversation in real time. But as we look at infrastructure components, we look at highlighting and building off for the rest of the school year, we are having the conversation with people who are directly connected with our schools, with their children on a daily basis. And that's of critical importance to us. And so as we move into the spring and the summer months, we will continue to build off of these strategies but what you see in front of you are really the work that is happening right now in response to the uptick we've seen in race and hate bias, as well as many of the other items that have been happening within our schools. We go to, I believe, the final slide. Um, and I think this slide kind of is a, is a summary um, that it is really about all of us um, as we do this. And really, uh, going back to what Council said at the beginning, we really have to have an emphasis on how we keep our, our students, our staff um, safe in our school buildings and doing it together. Thank you. Thank you. Is that everybody on the panel? That, here we are. Well, first off, thank you very, very much for all that you do. And I know that you never get enough thanks. And, and we sincerely appreciate this. Um, can you please explain what happens if an incident takes place in your schools? If two students have a verbal or a physical fight, what takes place then? Okay, uh, I'll field this one. So if two students have a, a physical or a verbal fight, um, let's kind of walk you through. Uh, staff that are, that are closest um, to, to the scene would intervene. Uh, there may, depending on the severity, be a call for security assistance. The, lo the closest security team member would, would report to the scene. Uh, an administrator also would hear that call over a radio uh, and report to the scene. And they would de-escalate the situation, um, make sure that stu no student is harmed or requires any type of physical attention or needs to go to the health room. Um, the students would then be separated. Uh, and there'd be a reflective conversation, a debrief, right? They would, we would ask the students individually what happened, speak to them about, about what occurred, um, take down their thoughts, their feelings on the situation, depending on what the actual the level of the incident. Um, there are tiers, right, in our code of conduct that can be applied based on student history, uh, the level of physical aggression, so on and so forth, the level of disruption, whatever it may, may be. Um, and then at, at that point, uh, really, there's a, there's a conversation, a collaborative conversation amongst the administrative team and perhaps with the counselor or a trusted adult with that student as well. 
Um, certainly the parents are called, I should say, uh, once we had this, the situation de-escalated to inform the parents that this, this is going on. And there's really a triaging around what the, the response is. And so that is where possibly, potentially, a restorative justice or a restorative approach conversation could come into play. If both parties are interested in having that conversation, it may need to be delayed, certainly, if emotions are high in that moment. Um, but we would make sure the students are safe. Uh, we would make sure they had access to their counselor, to their academic work, as, as need be. Um, and if it would, does require a disciplinary response, as spelled out in the Code of Conduct, we would employ that disciplinary response. We would let the parents know. We would make arrangements for the parents um, along those lines. And then ultimately, the goal is not to just issue discipline and remove the student from the learning environment. That doesn't work. Okay, um, And so what we really want to do is to restore whatever occurred, and if that's a restoration of that relationship between the two students, or if that's a restoration of a relationship between a student and an adult, whatever it may be, so the students who have, who have committed something that required a response are then welcomed back and included in the community and supported throughout. So I don't know if there's additional. Yeah, I just wanted to make clear because I think this is a point that um, uh, sometimes doesn't get out there. Um, just because there's a restorative response does not mean that there is no discipline or or a consequence that comes with an action. It really depends. Uh, there's a great big difference between two second graders shoving each other because they want the same ball at recess than something that is premeditated, planned, recorded, the, the, the variance is huge. And so all of those factors are taken into consideration as a part of the investigation, which may include camera review, it may include sourcing or, or, or um, having witnesses stating what happened. There are many factors um, that, are, that are important. Um, when it comes to the restorative part, it's really important to focus on the root of the behavior and the bringing back of the relationship. The reason that that's super important is we know that when it comes to suspensions, expulsions, and other exclusionary practices, often there's a high degree of recidivism, right? We know that because we don't appropriately sometimes address the behavior and the, the root of that behavior the first time, then it allows for it to happen again, which makes our school environments less safe. So our commitment to taking a restorative approach is about our care and concern for the students as well as the environment. When we take a restorative approach, it's not just for the student in front of us, it's for all of our students. Um, so I, I just want to clarify that. It really depends on the circumstance. And, and, I, and I appreciate that. So do you have any idea, percentage-wise, how many do not repeat the same issue again? I would just say, sitting here before you at the table, I don't know that we have, have that data, um, but we would have to, you'd have to really look at that student by student and school by school. I, I, I would appreciate knowing that information to see what is and what isn't working. Uh, I think that that's, that's uh, information that would be, that would be helpful. If, if um, you have, and we talked about the hate violence, and obviously that's a, a huge concern. Do you, once you've had the, the, the discussions uh, and it's not tolerated, and no one wants it to be tolerated. But once you've had the discussions, do you have any idea how many, how many people, how many times it's been repeated by the same person again? Can we follow up with you on Please. those two data points? And I heard two around hate bias, but also for groups of students and or individuals that have gone through a restorative justice opportunity. I, I appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. And. On, I guess it was slide seven. I don't know if you can bring it back up or not. It was the one where the, the pie chart was located. Yeah, there you go. I got that. You know, I understand medical assistance. And I know that, that of our 160,000 plus students, there's always, uh, Jerry Weiss years ago told me, he said, um, you know, there were, in those days there was 160,000 uh, students and 20,000 uh, 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 employees, and he says, what's the chance of everybody having a good day the same day? And it's none. I mean, let's face facts. You're, you're a large city. And, and uh, but having said that, and I certainly understand the medical assistance, and, you know, we, we want every student to be safe, but it's about 45 percent or plus that, that's uh, what I consider very different uh, concerns. If someone has uh, a weapon or alcohol or whatever, 
then then that's a huge a huge problem and um i what happens and, and you've gone through and you're going to get me some other information but what happens if a, someone has a weapon what first up what is a weapon what is considered a weapon if a student um is suspected of having a weapon or yes. ha or has a weapon we do um ask for our schools to um contact their ceo um, to have them report to the schools to be able to help them out in terms of a safe search or we conduct the search on property, a self-search, I should say. Um, but we do prefer to do that with our police partners rather than our school staff doing that. When we think of weapons, um, the weapons can include knives, a firearm, bomb, um, are the main weapons that um, I would highlight in terms of what we are uh, speaking of at that particular time. In addition, I would also include brass knuckles um, as a form of a weapon. But when we are aware or believe we are aware, of course, the first concern would be to isolate the student as quickly as possible, but we also want to work directly with our law enforcement partners around that. Can you, and you're, we certainly have the percentages, but what are the percentages percentages of? Are they how many incidents actually did we have weapons uh, in other uh, other areas in our schools? Well, not just types, but I mean any time that they that they've had a weapon. I mean if you if you uh, well it's fourteen percent, but it's fourteen percent of what? Is it, how many? What's the raw number? Yeah, total incident number. Fourteen percent, twenty-five hundred. One second. Can we do the math real quick? Well, I can. No math features. Yeah. Page. Oh, there you go. How we do that? Yeah, there you go. I don't want to interject, but yeah. maybe it's fourteen percent of one hundred and sixty-two serious incidents. No, no, no. 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 It's just the buses. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's up twenty-five hundred. Yeah. And if, and if you can't find it, you can certainly get back to us. But, but that to me matters as well, is, that, is the number itself. And I'm going to let others go for on this. I mean, I'm certainly not the only person that wins to the concerns. But for the CEO, did you find the number? I, I did. Sorry, did you raise your hand? We have, I'm very <laughs> impressed. I'm we have very a, impressed. We have, yeah. a, we have a live <laughs> dashboard. Yeah. So we're literally trying to so, so it looks like the raw number here, knives and other weapons, is 218. 218. And... Um, for the CE, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And for the CEOs that are, you know, working with students, and in in the old in the prior days, they were mentors in some cases, and, and I understand that some some students had issues. But um, it's my understanding that in some schools, the principals have invited the CEO to be in the building. Is do we have a number for? I've seen somebody said three, but I don't know whether that's the correct number. No? Do you, Oman? I don't know the exact number. I think most of our CEOs have been, to one extent or another, invited into the schools at various points during the, either the day or the week. But not for an incident, to actually be in, in the building? Right. You don't know that? Uh, and that would be, please. We don't have a number, but I, I do agree with, um, Chief Yamada, that they have been invited into the buildings. Um, some have even gone to our elementary schools as well, not for an incident, but again, to form the presence, to form the relationships. Um, but we don't have an exact number on that. Okay, thank you. And and I, I know everybody has questions, so I'm gonna, but, um, and do the, do, do the police have a, a brief overview of of what you're doing for prevention do you have any type of uh presentation for us if not you do you know yeah, we i can i can start okay. i don't have a, a powerpoint I hope okay, you well, that's fine. but thank you to the council for inviting us um i'll go back in time a little bit to give you a little background and then an overview i'll let lieutenant parker chime in as well um you know, in the aftermath of the school shooting at Columbine High School that occurred uh, April 20th of 99, 
Um, the Montgomery County Police Department, along with other agencies across the nation, um, stand committed to providing um, dedicated officers to uh, support the safety, the overall safety of the public, uh, the schools, the staff, the students, and their families. Um, Montgomery County Police Department started an informal program within our six police districts utilizing patrol officers in 1999. Uh, in 2002, a formal educative, educational facilities officer program was established utilizing a Department of Justice grant. In 2013, the program became known as the School Resource Officer Program. In the summer of 2021, the Community Engagement Officer Program uh, uh, began in the fall of 2021. Um, where uh, in that particular instance, the officers were stationed outside the school and were re responsible for all schools in their cluster. So, for instance, one CEO would oversee um, a greater high school and then all of the middle and elementary schools within that school cluster, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. In April of 2022, the current CEO 2.0 Memorandum of Understanding was implemented where the CEO works collaboratively uh, with the school administrators of their schools to address security concerns and have the opportunity to engage the students um, in a positive environment. Um, just a little background further, uh, back in 2010, we had 32 CEOs, uh, six sergeants, uh, that was in 2010. We currently have 26 officers and three uh, to include three sergeants uh, we also have incorporated gaithersburg city pd rockville city pd the sheriff's office who sees uh, oversees magruder and a new partner montgomery county uh, park police uh, who was at wheaton high school uh, they became operational in november of 2022 uh, our ceos have a, an average year of experience of 18 years on the department uh, we have 24 right now, so we have two vacancies out of the 26. Uh, we have 11 who are African American, nine who are Caucasian, four who are Hispanic, uh, and we have 14 males and 10, uh, 14 males and 10 females overall. And I'll let uh, Lieutenant Parker go over some of the training that they receive. Uh, good morning again. So all of our. CEOs attend the Maryland Center for School Safety that you've already heard about, which is an 80 hour course that includes 26 areas of instruction, uh, including expanded mo modules on de escalation, disability and diversity awareness, implicit bias, and restorative approaches. Uh, they also, each CEO is required to be crisis intervention team trained, which is a 40 hour course. That course includes instruction from health and human services, mental health uh, professionals, and the SRO course that is offered by the Maryland Center for School Safety is instructed by, uh, of course, law enforcement professionals, professionals in the legal community, attorney general's office, state's attorney's office, mental health professionals as well, as well as uh, public ed education. The Maryland Center for School Safety also provides recurring training in the summertime. So even it's not a one time and done, the uh, officers will attend training at the end of each school year. Additional training includes from our Special Operations Division, active assailant response, and that occurs uh, in Montgomery County Public School buildings uh, during times that the staff and students are not in the building. And our Special Investigations Division also provides instruction to CEOs on opioid awareness and prevention. And as to speak to your question, uh, Council Member Katz, Katz is, uh, we have weekly meetings or monthly meetings with uh, Dana and her staff, uh, with the CEOs, Captain Satinsky, Lieutenant Parker, we all take uh, part in those meetings where issues are discussed. We uh, cover events that are coming up, things like that. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call on Chair Juwando and then Councilmember Lukey. I have a feeling if I look to my left, I'm going to see a few other people that would like to be called on. So, uh, Chair. Thank you, Chair Katz. And thank you for the uh, presentation and, again, all the work that, that's being done. And I appreciate the continuum and, and the explanation for our public. It's important. A um, couple of questions. Uh, start with MCPS. So there were less calls 
for service this year so far, and it looks like no matter what happens the rest of the year, there will be less calls for service this year. Uh, 2,800 last year versus 1,300 this year, if I'm looking on page three of the packet. Uh, there's, and then of the incidents, there's also, there was a higher percentage of reports being made from these calls, whereas last year it was a, less than half of the time there was a call and there was not a report, right? So could you just explain that data of what, in your view, is happening as far as the school service calls, the drop, and then the, you know, I, I have a theory about what's happening here, but I want to let you explain it and not, not put my theory. Sure, it may be a combo explanation possibly with um, our CEO partners, but one thing is the, is the difference between last year and this year. We really all, um, have taken the time last year to put in a lot of services and understand how our students re-entered into school through the social emotional wellness component. One of the things that you heard from uh, Ms. Jordan B was just around the restorative justice coaches being in many of our schools, being able to really dictate where they're needed most as a proactive measure versus a reactive measure. In addition, we do have social workers in our second in our high schools, and that has been one thing in terms of people being able to access that resources um, more efficiently, as well as timely versus having to wait. So when you bring in a component that is a need that wasn't there before, then students have access to that to be able to process, to think twice, to get resources before actually engaging in something that they probably maybe would have done in the past, whereas last year we were learning the landscape. We learned it, we put some strategies in place. In addition, going into this year, the second component we talked about was taking the time in the summer to really work with our security staff as well as our um, administrators, but also thinking about as our staff came back into the building for this year, thinking about de-escalation training, restorative practice training, um, really the consideration around we have our curriculum that we definitely know that we have to teach but also knowing that we have to attend to who comes to us from the very beginning. So when we do call for service, um, those service calls, as I said, they run a continuum of the, the very, I don't want to say insignificant, but it could be we have a dog on campus that's chasing kids during lunch and we need a little bit of additional support to the very extreme of what we talked about in terms of weapons that are within the space. I, I appreciate that, and I just think it's important to note that calls for service have gone down mm -hmm. from last year to this year. I just think, you know, sometimes we, we don't recognize the facts of the data there. Every call, every serious incident, we never want that to happen, but I appreciate you laying that out. Um, to our police partners, the, the phone calls, because obviously anyone can call from the school, student, everyone, you know, my kids have cell phones, you know, people can call, so people call you. I read in the packet that you said you cannot distinguish, about half the calls have gone to fire, half go to police, of the 11,000 school-related calls. Um, 1,000 have gone to the dedicated line that was created. So a two-part question. Seems like maybe people aren't quite familiar with the dedicated line, I, from my assumption from reading this. And is that your experience? I'll just let you answer that first. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So the dedicated line is predominantly utilized by staff at the school. That's an MCPS non-emergency line to our communication center. Uh, the school service call is a indication that our communications personnel are trained to identify that call. So if a call is received at a particular school involving students, staff, something that's occurring on campus or involving a student, they will indicate that call as a uh, school service call. If a person calls in from the community and says, uh, I have an incident that's occurring, and they just use the school as a landmark, that would not be indicated as a school service Got call. It. Okay. And then you also stated in there that you cannot distinguish in your between non-emergency calls and 911 calls. Is that is that true for the general public? So if, if, if I, if John Q. Public picks up the phone and dials not police, not emergency versus 911. 
we don't know that they called non-emergency versus 911? Yeah. yeah, to be honest with you, I, I would have to ask our ECC uh, partner to yeah. get an answer for that one. Well, I just think it's important to maybe follow up for staff. We should, if we don't have that capability, I think we should have it and we should help you have it. Yeah. The only clarification I can add to that is that all of the calls go to the same um, emergency communications specialist, sure. the call takers. Yeah. Um, I've called non-emergency several times and they absolutely identify as the non-emergency line when I call. Um, I will um, talk with Chief Yamada and the ECC to see if we can further break down that data as what gets tracked through each line. Yeah. I think we, should, we would just want to know that. Okay. Can, can I just jump in for a second on the, the calls for, if, if there's a medical emergency, if they would the school be calling the the dedicated line, or they'd be calling nine one one. They would call nine one one. So that's one of the reasons yeah. that we're not sure. getting the the use of. I mean, half of the calls are medical emergencies. Yeah, and it's new and traffic. Right, well, that's it. Time. But it's in the office. Too. Um, okay, so appreciate that, and we'll follow up on that. The arrests uh, that have happened this year so far just. I want to talk about just the second question, and then I'll turn to colleagues, is arrests and the suspensions. I'll start with suspensions, actually. So deep disparities continue and persist on who's suspended. Um, and if you look at the vast majority of what people are suspended for, fights and disruption and disrespect are by far the, the highest, um, which are the things that I think most people are used to happening in schools. Uh, obviously, there's varying degrees, as you talked about, of fights. There's varying degrees of disrespect or disruption. Um, but, you know, for example, over half the students in both of those categories were African American students. Um, and, and then the other, another 30 or so percent Latino students. Could you talk about your concern I, 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 that I heard you express in those numbers and what we're doing to dig into that? Um, because obviously, fights and disruption happen in every school every day. Um. So I, I appreciate that um, because this is uh, not just urgent but important. Um, one of the things that we know with uh, restorative approaches in Montgomery County Public Schools is that we do track the top incidents that it's utilized for. And the number one incident that it's utilized for is fights. So 119 fights this year, followed by disruption, disrespect, surprisingly class cutting, and then in 16 incidents threat to a student. So those numbers do kind of align with where we're seeing our exclusionary practices disproportionately applied. And so that's one of the ways that we are making sure that we're training our leaders in implicit bias, in um, strategies for ensuring that we're getting to the root of the, the issue and ensuring that it doesn't happen again, to be able to re reduce that for all of our students. Um, another take that we're looking at is we are working across departments in meeting monthly about student suspensions. Um, one of the things that that allows us to do, that disparity exists not just between our, our students of color, but also our students with IEPs. Yeah. So we're working closely with our um, Department of Special Education, as well as another other, a number of other divisions in order to look at our processes and protocols. Some of the things that we are noticing are technical in nature. So a small one that, that might be technical is disrespect. Disrespect is not something that is suspendable for an out-of-school suspension, right? So we're taking a look at that because we do have 60 suspensions that are for disrespect. So going through and reviewing each of those case by case and looking at the training that's needed in the interpreting and the utilization of the code of conduct. We're also taking a look at how we increase our supports in building relationships with specific students within our schools. Students who may have been marginalized or students who may have been impacted in one way or another because we do know that um, not only our suspension rates in those categories um, have disparities, but it does align with our chronic absenteeism. Yeah. It does align with need for SSL hours, graduation rates, things like that. So there's a connection that goes a little bit deeper. One thing that we do know that is encouraging is that over the years, and particularly the last six years, we've managed to reduce those suspensions specifically for African American and Hispanic students who are not impacted by socioeconomic status. So in our, our not free and reduced males population, those suspensions have actually changed over time, going from about 15% uh, to about 7% and 9% respectively in each of those subgroups. So we do know we're making impact. The question is where that impact 
impact is. And for me, at a much, much broader level, it does speak to some of the societal concerns that we have, and it, it, it does raise things like how are our community schools contributing, mm -hmm. right? How are we um, reducing those, um, those other gaps that contribute to some of that? Um, looking at our early intervention and pre-K programs, how are we treating our youngest learners when they come in, when they are specifically impacted in those areas? Because what we're doing is repeating that cycle of trauma. And, and you can see it. And so some of these stopgap measures include for individual schools that have high levels of disproportionality, they are creating their own school level action plans in order to specifically address that. We just recently last month had a summit with all of the school teams. Uh, we met with 15 specific schools that have higher levels of disproportionality than others to examine and analyze the data at a deeper level and to work on a plan to address that for specific specific students so that we can stop re you know, replicating the cycle. I do want to close with something that's really important. And I, I've been thinking about this a lot personally. So when I started in 2005, the population of MCPS was slightly different. We had about 42% of our population that was uh, African American and Hispanic Latino combined, 19% being Hispanic Latino. Now this year, we have about 56% um, that is a combined population with our Hispanic Latino population growing tons. So from 19% to about 35%. So that suspension rate at about 80% still exists then and it exists now. However, it's important to note that the population has changed, which means that the gap itself has changed, right? So when we're feeling the, the urgency and it's essential that it be urgent because all of our kids are all of our kids, there has been progress over time in reducing that gap. There's a lot of work ahead of us, and we've got to be able to fund it, and we've got to be able to keep our eyes on it. So I, I do want to acknowledge that. I appreciate that you brought that up, um, because that's why this work is critical, because we want to make sure that all of our students are served. Thank you. I, I appreciate that very robust response, and I agree with you. Progress has been made. Um, I was starting my questioning talking about the progress I think has been made on calls for service. We, we are moving in the right direction. Any incident is we, we really are worried about, um, but I want to follow up in ENC and specifically on the suspension and you know on those plans. I, I just really appreciate that. Um, we've been funding on this council, all my colleagues, uh, additional funding as you know for restorative justice training. We did it a couple years ago to train all the middle schools. We I'm really happy to hear about the expansion of the RJ specialists. So that's really really important. Uh, my last question for the police on the arrests, and then I'll pass, pass and come back uh, again if we have time, is we, I don't, one of the things that precipitated this debate was the disparity in arrest data, right? And who was arrested uh, and kind of following on, realizing that this discipline pipeline is a part of the arrest pipeline because many are referrals, right, to the police department for fights or whatever, whatever the arrestable issue is. Uh, I saw some data presented in here, but I do not see it broken down on race and ethnicity or students with disability. That was a key measure that we talked about tracking with the school system and that there's supposed to be meeting these meetings that you, you mentioned, Chief Yamada, where that was going to be monitored as part of this larger process. And so can you speak to what that data is of the arrests that were made this school year, the breakdowns? So I believe the race data should be included in that. We did notice that the ethnicity, we will have to have uh, our information management and technology division pull the ethnicity so we have a full picture. We can get that. And can you point to, because I might have missed it. I don't think it's in there. No. And I see our staff okay. saying, no, it's not okay. there. And I look pretty good. <laughs> so. Total we'll make sure we get it through. Right, yeah, that was the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The question we'll is, sure that's the whole precipitous yeah. of this discussion for, for many of us of why we why we got to it. So I just think to not have that is is, 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 is a missing thing. So please follow up on that. Said, yeah, and I hope that in the conversations with MCPS when you're meeting weekly or monthly, that that is part of the discussion because, that, again, that we're just trying to continually improve. So, um, okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We're Councilmember Lukey, then we're going to Councilmember Mink, and then we're going to go to Councilmember Member Knox. Thank you. Um, since we were just on this topic, I want to go to the, the disruption issue and, and also to ask our, our law enforcement partners who are here. So, you know, 
26101 of the education article allows for a misdemeanor charge for disruption, right? And there's been an effort over the past couple of years to try and change that so that that did not exist for students in their own school, right? So if a, because if another student came who was not from that school and started disrupting the educational environment, who wasn't supposed to be on school grounds, it could also be a trespass, but that was something there. Or if it was a parent, because unfortunately we have had issues where parents are making the threats or disrupting the educational environment. Um, I know they have not changed the law here in Maryland yet, but there is a Fourth Circuit opinion, Kenny versus Wilson, um, emanating out of South Carolina where the law was pretty clear and if, if it doesn't change this session it's got to get changed because it won't be compliant with Fourth Circuit law. But I raise that because that is a lesser charge than what would come if it was reckless endangerment or a second degree assault. Is that right? I believe so. So second degree assault is a felony charge, right? Mm -hmm. If I tell you it's a felony I, charge. I believe so. <laughs> okay. And reckless endangerment is a misdemeanor with a five year or and or five thousand dollar penalty, correct? Five year sentence. Sounds right. All right. And then the one we were talking about before, the disruption in twenty six one oh one of the education article is two years and or twenty five hundred dollar fine. Does that sound about right? Sounds right. Okay. All right. So sometimes lesser charges are given for a thing that could have been a higher charge. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, and I'm I have a couple I have things I've written down based on what you said and some other stuff. Uh, so. And that would, that would come from an evaluation of a lot of things sure. and discussion with state's attorney's office and things like that. Yeah. And, that and that would be fact specific, yes. take into account other mm -hmm. considerations related to mm -hmm. that individual student or group of students involved in the incident, is that right? Correct. Okay. You talked about, um, and we were talking about the difference between arrest and a referral to DJS, and then of course we have the citations over here. So an arrest is counted in your data as a custodial arrest. Is that how you're accounting and qualifying an arrest? Yes. Okay. And then a referral to DJS also subjects the person to the, the criminal justice system, if you will, but is uh, for individuals under age 18. Is that right? Correct. Okay, and the citations are for civil offenses. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And so if an incident happens on school grounds, between two students and the school does its disciplinary function um, and MCPD or the other CEOs may or may not be called to the school, a parent of the victim still has the right to swear out a referral to DJS, is that right? That's correct. Okay, so in terms of the numbers of referrals to DJS, are those only the numbers of referrals to DJS that were done by our officers or does that also include instances where the family of a victim came to get a referral to DJS? I believe it's just our officers. Okay. Do you have any idea or could you find the data sometime to give back um, about the number of referrals to DJS that were done at the request of the parent or guardian of a victim? Sure, we can try to find that for you. Okay. Um, so we talked about the training that was that is required by state law. So when it started in 2019, it was rolled out here actually first. Montgomery County uh, SROs were the first group to be trained in that new model curriculum in April of 2019. And then by the start of the 2019-2020 school year, every SRO and all school security employees in the state of Maryland had to be trained. And it was, it was a long summer. <laughs> I drove all over the state of Maryland. It was a long summer. Um, but then we had the pandemic. So the initial academic year under the new training model that was issued statewide got cut short. So, um, and in the interim, the training was still delivered virtually and then went back into in person. I actually delivered in-service training to MCPD in August 2020 on, on school law and any changes to school law. So. It now is a 70, sorry, 80 hour program um, that's hybrid delivered. And, and that covers expanded things on um, de-escalation, all right, and restorative approaches, um, attention to individuals with disabilities, um, you know, the development of the adolescent brain, a whole host of things. 
and all folks who work as school security employees or SROs are supposed to have this training. Is that right? All right. So, but we have a unique model in MCPS where our school security employees don't report to the school safety coordinator, which is what other jurisdictions do. They report to the principals. Is that correct? Okay. And so prior to the start of this school year, for the 2022-2023 school year, there were a number of school security employees who had been working in the school system during the last school year who hadn't received any of that training. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. And do you know how many people that was that were affected by that? I don't have the number. What I, what I will share with you is upon realizing that we rectified it mm -hmm. immediately, um, to be able to get our security staff trained. You're right, the pandemic came in and kind of turned things topsy-turvy for us to be able to do that. Our school security don't report to our central office. Right. They don't report directly to Director Clark. Right. However, what we realize is that our work with the principals and school staff is critical. Mm -hmm. um, and so we work with them in tandem. Um, we were able to get um, the staff who had not been trained at the beginning of the year trained mm -hmm. um, based on the model that the Center for School Safety has in place. And so we continue to do that throughout the year. One of the, the, the areas of difficulty that we often have is the training is, is occurring during the school day. And so we have to pull our security assistants out of school for about four days for them to be able to attend this training. And then we have to determine how to backfill. So we try to have a good balance in terms mm -hmm. of not leaving a location uncovered, but also being very attentive to the requirement that we have. And so we have put some structures in place to be able to do that and have worked very closely with the facilitator to be able to um, think about our, our needs um, okay. that will support that. Yeah, and I think at least two of the four or five times that the state offered that training was during June, late June, post dismissal, and August um, before school went back into session too, because of exactly that reason, right? Um, and they're doing that again this year, and that will be very helpful for our staff. Mm -hmm. um, but we also want to make sure that there there are many that we would like to try to get in in the spring. And in the slide, we talked about additional staffing being able to figure out how to support and balance without creating unnecessary gaps in the school day. And the restorative approaches program um, you know it's 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 meant to help students grow and not repeat the same conduct and to facilitate resolution of con conflict and of course it's as it says in the state law it's preventive and proactive emphasizes building strong relationships and setting clear behavioral expectations that contribute to the well-being of the school community one of the concerns that I've heard students and parents raising is that the expectations are laid out in the student code of conduct, but they feel there's a disconnect in them actually being enforced. And so when you have that situation where they're told one thing, but then they don't see it happening, and I, and I say this as the parent of four kids in MCPS schools, and, and even at my house, if I tell them, I'm going to do this, this is what has to happen, and I don't then deliver, the behavior gets worse. I think that's a great point. And um, we know that restorative practices or restorative approaches or restorative mm -hmm. justice takes more than five years to implement, and the size and scope of the school district matters. Um, when HB 725 came out, one of the things we were fortunate about was that they were places where we were already piloting right, right. Um, some of the approaches in mm -hmm. order to examine what works for our schools and, and how we would uh, train our staff and progress forward. Um, as you said, that same year we were interrupted by COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, the following year, all virtual, so our, our, our status or, or disciplinary concerns differed. Uh, than they would in person. Mm -hmm. So we didn't quite have any fights because no one was uh, in person. Right. right. So what we were looking at differed. And so we really came back strong when we came back um, in school year 2021. But we were working on the resources to mm -hmm. be able to, to implement um, the philosophy and the mindset at such a large scope. We were working with three specialists. And at the time, we hadn't had any of our, uh, our local coaches yet. Um, 
through student advocacy, parent advocacy, advocacy through support from members of the council, we were able to, to really improve that. What we're looking at this year is implementation. So the state had not yet released a guideline on what yeah. qualifies a school as a strongly restorative environment. This year in October, they did. So they released a voluntary rubric, mm -hmm. and we took a look at that rubric, aligned it with our findings from the anti-racist system audit, as well as the MCPS strategic plan. We took those standards and we expanded them from what the state asked for. So in the voluntary rubric, it asked us to look at the district, whether it was not yet implemented, partially implemented, or fully implemented. We expanded that in adding additional criteria around the data analysis, mm -hmm. and then also um, decided we wanted to see what schools were doing this at a high, high level that could serve as model schools. So we expanded it from not yet partially and fully to schools that were reactive, so you're not yet, schools that were in the early stages, which is probably where is most appropriate for this timeline, mm -hmm. schools that were in intermediate implementation with moderate success, and then schools that were uh, what we call mature. So, you know, we are looking for schools to start moving from that early stage into that intermediate stage. We might have schools that may never get to that fully mature stage, but it's something that we're going to continue to work on. We took that rubric, and all schools had to do that rubric from January to March and submit their results, including okay. evidence and things like that from a team. So here's where we stand as of today. So schools are required to be done by the end of this month, mm -hmm. but we have over 187 schools already reporting. Right. Of 187 schools, we have 8.5 that are in the reactive phase. We know that for next year, when we look at how we allocate those specialists, mm -hmm. not only is disparities or disproportionality a concern, we have to look at those 8.5% of schools that are reactive to start working on goal setting with them in order to build upon implementation. About 60% of our schools are in the early phases, mm -hmm. as is appropriate, and we're going to continue to work with those schools to get them to continue to move the work forward. We have about 25% of our schools that are already intermediate, fully implemented, and doing well. We want to look at those schools to see how to mature them, and we have about 3 to 4% of our schools that are already in mature implementation. We want to be able to examine those schools for impact and then start looking at how to utilize some of the approaches that they've put in place and bring that to scale. So I'm really excited about this work. Um, there's been some interesting reporting around it, but we are voluntarily going through each of this process school by school. The rubric that was uh, shared voluntarily for the state is for the district. We've already completed that. Um, but we're expanding that. We're expanding all parts of that so we can work on the implementation. We know that restorative approaches often fail in large school districts because of the implementation. Mm -hmm. So we're taking a look at that. And we're going to be working with our school leaders around that specifically. Yeah, I mean, I know it's a, it's a labor-intensive process, and you have to be fully invested in doing it every day, and you have to be fully invested in making sure it's appropriate for the individual situation. and. I think I heard you say earlier that it is, you know, wholly voluntary for things like a restorative circle or where a, an individual who has harmed another student, if the victim is okay with that kind of a discussion, then it's okay. Yes. But they are not being forced to do that, correct? So community circles the ones that focus on relationship building. So we mm -hmm. might talk about like what goals do we have for ourselves or um, what makes me the, the happiest? What are things that I consider my strength? Things that help us to get to know each other and build perspective. Community circles are a part of our approach, our, our tier one approaches. Um, they would be, if you've ever experienced class meetings at our elementary school level, similar to that. Those are just a part of your day-to-day -day school experiences. However, if something has happened like there's been a fight or an event, we do make sure that participants want to participate in order to move forward. Um, one of the things that we're also exploring, um, and, and I'll save this for another time because I'm going to cede the floor to my colleagues who have important work to discuss as well, um, but we're in, in exploring consents for when it comes from central office. Sometimes schools have a tricky or challenging situation mm -hmm. that requires a little bit more 
<clears throat> I'm sorry, expertise than our local coaches who are still very brand new. Our, our elementary coaches just existed since August, right? So they might not be there yet in their proficiency. When we are coming in from central office, we're making sure that we're using consents because we're outsiders that are coming in. Much like our partners, for example, Conflict Resolution Centers of Montgomery County and other partners that help us with mediation, we're making sure we're tightening up the consent process for formal circles. Informal circles at school are different. Um, yeah, uh, have you implemented Handle with Care yet? Or what's the status with implementation of that? Yeah, we've begun implementation with ha Handle with Care, but I, 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 as sitting here right with you today, I cannot give you a specific update in terms of what Ms. Shawna K. Durandi just shared with respect to restorative justice. Okay, and then um, there was there were questions and and about the calls for emergency services for, um, you know, when medical personnel need to respond and and with respect to athletic events um, and the plans, you have different plans for managing emergency response with respect to student athletes that are required under state law under the Elijah Gorham Act that are separate and distinct from how you would be managing crowd control or so you would you know based on the numbers that were presented and the percentages um, what was related to an injury on the field so to speak or a medical issue related to a student athlete versus incidents overall I, let me just see if I can, if I get clarity on, on that question. So you're essentially asking if we have, is it a call for 911 or is it a serious incident data that you're looking to disaggregate between the two? I'm sorry. No. So, you know, I think there's a distinction in, in the public's mind between, you know, during the football game, a player's injured and, and EMS has to come tend and they take the student away versus there's a knife fight behind the stands, right? Mm -hmm. So. My question is whether you know and have a breakout of how many calls were related to athletics, like just for injuries, versus athletics as an event. We don't have that data today. However, mm -hmm. if we could do a follow-up in terms of disaggregating it by the injuries mm -hmm. versus actual events that occur at those um, games. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Member Mink. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all for the information uh, that you've brought for us today. Um, question, is MCPS using uh, mobile crisis teams to respond to student incidents? And can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, so it depends on the, it depends on the, you know, it's clearly what, what the, the incident is. Um, but we partner with, uh, with the Department of Health and Human Resources as well. We have our, our, our internal well-being professionals, including our, our um, Division of Psychological Services and our social workers. Um, and we have a, a crisis response psychologist. And we mobilize and partner with uh, HHS, uh, to what, depending on what the situation is, if, if it happens to be um, you know, a, a loss of life or if we have something that occurs uh, in a home or is tangentially related to the community. Uh, we partner to ensure that the family has the support they need uh, as well through our, our internal professionals who work within the school and the students in, in that community. The answer is yes. Do we have data on what kinds of incidents um, the MCPS is calling in mobile crisis teams for and the, the outcomes of those? Again, I, I don't have it here before me, but certainly that is data that we can we can retrieve for you. That would be great. Thank you. Mr. Warnby, did you want to? I was going to mention the majority of calls to mobile crisis inside of the school um, are uh, often around student distress. Uh, that's also reflected in the medical emergency incidents that you might see in the other data. I know you asked about athletics, but that, that's something that has increased for us post-pandemic, um, if a student is in an emotional crisis state, <clears throat> mobile crisis unit is one of the tools we can use. Some of our professionals are also um, uh, licensed to be able to do an emergency petition as well. So it may not always go through either of those two routes. Thank you. Um, yeah, one thing that I noticed is that um, there was a, a recommendation by the County Executives Reimagining School Safety and Student Wellbeing Committee to add um, DHHS as um, uh, as a party to the MOU, and I didn't see that that had been done. Is there, does anyone happen to have insights as to 
The DHHS to the MOU that it currently exists between uh, M Montgomery County Police and mm -hmm. the school system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so there are um, there are bi-monthly uh, multi-agency meetings that occur, uh, and Captain Stinsky is there, uh, and Chief Dear Trebens is there as well, and myself and others from from each of our teams. Uh, Kirsten Anderson, so on and so forth, and we've been looking at that this year. When we actually sat down and, and took a look at what the the, the current uh, agreement is between HHS and Montgomery County Public Schools, and then looked as well uh, at the at the the MOU with the police, and and what we have seen is there's not a lot of organic intersection there. The agreement that we have with HHS largely pertains to data sharing and the type of data that we share. Um, so we are currently working on thinking about almost a breakdown, a formal breakdown of when we have each agency in our school, when we have our Bridge to Wellness folks in our school, for example, when we have the, the mobile crisis response from HHS, and then we have our, our police uh, partners in our schools along with our internal personnel, our social workers, our counselors, what, how each of these agencies responds, kind of an our, a my job, your job, our job breakdown. Um, but we have not put those two together yet in one additional MOU. And I know that, that, um, that uh, Chief Edwards' office is exploring the police portion of the MOU. Um, but that, we are looking at this right now, and we meet bi-monthly, and that is the work that we're engaged in at this moment. Great. Good to hear that there's progress being made there. And there was a suggestion to include in that one MOU um, kind of a plan for wh who do we call for what and to include mobile crisis support, which I didn't see in there yet. So it's great to hear that you're making progress on that. Um, OK, I wanted to dig in a little bit to um, restorative justice in terms of uh, who is implementing it, um, who is uh, uh, handling it, and then also what exactly the process looks like. Because I know there's been a lot of questions in the public. We've seen some of the press. Um, and um, you know, I know that we have a lot of positive outcomes. We have a lot of positive data points, um, restorative justice. Um, as, as a technique that we can use in our schools is very well proven nationally. So really want to see it do well and see us use it to its best potential. Um, and, um, but I also know that we have some concerns in the public. And so as you were mentioning, implementation is key uh, and we're always looking to improve. So I just wanted to better understand uh, and then get any insights. Um, how is MCPS choosing and vetting um, the restorative justice coaches at the schools. So, if, if you, I'd like to start kind of high level, and then I will pass it over to to Director Durandi. I think, as 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 Sean Kay addressed the previous question, she gave a lot of information and a lot of detailed information and specifics of, of, about the numbers and and what the state has said and what we've done. I think to zoom out from this a little bit, if we go back to 2019 and think about what each of these school years have looked like. And last year, if we can go back in time and just think for a moment of the amount of operational um, work that our schools were doing. They were contact tracing. We had high absentee rates of students and staff because of the Omicron variant. In addition to a lot of the challenges we saw about, we saw for students with um, wellness, safety, and security as they came, came back in. And we really focused on increasing the amount of, of personnel and allocation and structures and processes on RJ last year. And we're starting to see the, the fruit of that. So what I, I guess to start with your, your question about the implementation of RJ, I think what's important from what Shauna Kay said is we are able now through this guide, the guidelines of the state and the tools that our office has put in place as we work with our school supervisory directors to, for the first time, get a clear data-driven understanding of where that implementation stands across the district. So we have the observational data and we have the, 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 the guide that we've created. We have our quantitative data that we can look at in terms of referrals and look at it in terms of disposition. So we will have, coming into the, the, the new school year of, of 23-24, of July 1, data that will allow us to look and, and, as was spoken to, triangulate and differentiate the supports. Take those schools that have done it well and highlight their best practices to bring to scale across the district and provide that more direct coaching and support where the schools have not. I think at a large scale, that is what the implementation looks like, so that we will have a clear understanding district-wide and by schools of where we are based on data and where we need to, to, to uh, continue with our resources. Some of the pieces that you spoke about, how is it implemented? And you referenced some of the things that we've seen in the news recently. And so I would like, I would like um, Mr. Ambie to speak to. Yes, to like I actually, I have some like. specific questions, yeah. if, if I may. Sure. So thank you. So 
for the, the coaches? How are they chosen and vetted? And, and given that, I know, of course, you all have had dealing with a lot, and so you're going to be making, you know, tweaks and improvements and changes as we continue to learn and have more capacity. Um, but as things stand now, and or if you're looking at changing this, um, how is NCPS choosing and vetting the coaches? And I'm just going to ask that you be clear, direct, and concise with your answers so that we can get move along. You, you, you've been that, but just continue to do so. Thank you. So coaches are selected by school staff, by school principal. And because they're already staff in the school, it's not a separate position. It's a stipended position. Uh, coaches are paid $6,000 for 240 hours in secondary, $3,000 for 120 hours in elementary school. So they look at a number of factors. One, do you have the time commitment to be able to commit to the learnings that have to happen? Two, are you able to I, I, attend? I, I, I hate to interrupt, but I know we're trying to be quick. Um, are they are they released from any of their duties? They are not. This okay. is an additional duty. It's a stipend, yeah. just like a yeah, athletic coach. Double checking. Okay, thank you. And then, how is NCPS supporting those coaches, including training and development? Yeah, so they're able to attend not only like some of our not regional trainings, our our trainings from our universities. They're able to attend. Um, trainings from specialists that we invite to come in to present to them. They have a monthly PLC that they must attend that includes training from the RJ specialists at central office. And uh, they are allowed to, we have a budget for local trainings that they'd like to take, like online trainings with IIRP and other organizations that offer virtual trainings. Thank so, you. PLC. <laughs> PLC. Okay, yeah. so the, the requisite training for them is the monthly PLC. Yes. And then there's opportunities on top of that. That's it. Okay. Um, and then wanted to drill down on what specific restorative practices are being are being implemented within MCPS um, because I know we, as we've talked about a lot a lot of this is a, is a mentality it's a framework it's and all those all of those things are important um, but there is some confusion amongst amongst the public about what are some of the specific practices and and how are, how are we ensuring that those are being implemented with fidelity so schools do have autonomy in selecting some of their restorative approaches so you'll have variability from school to school but all schools focus on what we call the pillars. So there must include in their goal setting relationship building opportunities. And that can look different. That can look community circles, class meetings, et cetera. But all schools must have relationship building opportunities. Schools are also focused on co-creation of spacing spaces. So we study things like adultism and centering students and creation of our spaces, rules and expectations, et cetera. Um, schools also have to take a look at the full scope or spectrum of their wellness supports and if those are restorative in nature as well as processes for when something does happen. That's usually the focus. Um, when something does happen, how do they reintegrate students back into those spaces and work on repairing the relationships? Those could include alternatives to suspensions. They could include reflection activities. They could include mindfulness spaces, wellness spaces, any number of um, uh, different approaches or, or strategies so it sounds so there's a lot of different options here um, and my concern is that um, you know as we said implementation is so key if all of these schools are being given these enormous menus um, of, of options here how are we ensuring that each of them is being trained in a, in a very specific and systematic way to follow each of those steps for example community circles Right, there's very particular ways ways to do that. Um, restorative circles, especially, very particular ways ways to do that. So, um, you know, some of them are are uh, less likely to have a backfire situation happen if not done, you know, following the the exact guidelines. Um, but we want to make sure that any school that is doing, for example, restorative circles is following these exact best practices and that any of the staff members who are participating in those know exactly how, how to do that. Are we, how are we ensuring that? Where are the guidelines and the steps for each of those practices written? Excellent. Thank you. So we do provide a guide including uh, source text that we use that includes circle scripts. So people are not going at it on their own. They don't have to come up with the protocol and the process. Even the words are given for some of these circles. There's always variability. We use uh, one particular text called Circle Forward. Uh, I believe there's another one, Heart of Hope, that we equip schools with a toolkit of how to then apply these uh, practices. We also have, for the first time last year, 
a system-wide um, RGA mini training that goes through our compliance module. So every single staff member receives that, every bus driver, um, everyone that works with our cafeteria staff, our teachers, our parent educators. We often, we also offer specific sessions on, for example, Circle 101, Circle 102, we offer Mindfulness 1, Mindfulness 2. So we really are working beyond just those coaches in training our staff. I believe the number for last year of staff that's been trained in one of these practices, in one of the core, was 11,000. That's what we presented last year. 11,000 of our staff have received one of these core. And we're offering these sessions continually throughout the summer, and we're working on, with funding, uh, trying to build those out because that's an important component of it. Um, I can't go back to just saying that last year we were working with three people for a county of 160,000, right? That's a heavy lift. And so I'm encouraged that as we continue to increase the supports, that we'll just continue to build this out and examining it, like you said, as we go along to see what's working and what's not working. Great. Um, if we could see those that toolkit, that would be great, and the modules, that would be fantastic. Um, thank you. And then, and are we ensuring that um, any staff members who are implementing those practices have been through the toolkit, are familiar with it, have been through the modules, n make sure that they are uh, up to date with all the materials that are available to them? Yes, we're working on that. Um, I do want to caution, though, this is an important piece for me, that there are staff that already, as a part of their training, experience or support restorative approaches. So, you know, I had a parent share with me the other day, my child was RJ'd by the counselor. Well, the counselor is an appropriate person to mediate with children as it's a part of their counseling training, right? So our counselors, our sites, our social workers, class meetings without extensive training, that's okay for a teacher to be able to handle. That, that's a part of their core training. So I want to be clear about mm -hmm. some of those everyday practices mm -hmm. do not involve um, an in-depth course or experience, mm -hmm. but some of what you've mentioned, in particular, a restorative circle, when something has happened, um, do require a little bit more in-depth training. So yeah, um, and that's and that's the ones, of course, um, where we have seen a, a backlash and we've seen some negative fallout. We've we've seen those stories in the press, and I've you know heard some of them from families, um, and so that's where we want to make sure, of course, that we are that all the groundwork is laid in advance and it's being really implemented with fidelity. Um, and then if, if we could just talk a little bit um, about that practice in particular and, and what that looks like. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if let's say an incident occurs, whether it's a, a, a fight or maybe a, a hate bias incident, a student says something racist or anti-Semitic or transphobic or something, something like that, um, who determines whether a restorative circle should happen and how? So usually the school level. So I know from my team, we receive calls for service from schools that might be dealing with something particularly tricky. Um, yeah, no, you're fine. All right, we, we got four minutes. Yeah, yeah I we want do to make an effort. I want to clarify this. I think this is important. Yeah. We have social workers assigned to our department, and they're clinical social workers. So they are licensed therapists. Um, when our team goes out, our RJ specialist has a partner clinician that they work with. So can I, I – sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt. I really apologize. Okay. <laughs> but I appreciate you, et cetera. Um, okay, so when they are determining whether a circle should happen, um, is that uh, – is that – are we always ensuring that the students have a conversation, an independent conversation with somebody beforehand to understand what they should be weighing and whether they should be participating? Tricky. It's when it's when it's um, <clears throat> excuse me, when it's appropriate. So we can't we don't know that fully at the school level. That's something that we can take a look at. I can only speak to the circles that our team is engaged in like specific engagement okay. and what our practice and protocols are. We can share with you what we share with the coaches. But like any teacher or any teacher in practice, sometimes that goes awry and we don't have the individual oversight at okay. each and every school in each circumstance. Thank you. Who in MCPS has that kind of oversight? Because that's exactly what we were talking about. That's mm -hmm. the kind of practice that we need to ensure is happening at the, at the local level. 
Right. So we'll, we'll take a look at the, the protocol that we utilize for that. We do share that with schools. Um, and we are looking at, like you said, implementation and how well mm -hmm. those are implemented. We're also working with surveys after a restorative circle. And again, to be fair, I'm talking about a formal restorative conference mm -hmm. um, to look at how students have experienced that and how to improve going forward. Okay. Uh, so really quickly, I think what you're what you're talking when, when our team is called right. out, right? When the specialists are responding to a school mm -hmm. issue, we have been contacted by the principal or somebody in the school to respond. I think what I'm hearing you say is, okay, your people know to, to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. I mean, not necessarily. Not necessar I mean, I know no. you know, but how do we make sure that that is Got happening? It. And, then, and, and then even it sounds like in both circumstances, I've heard from families. Um, where they did not feel like that conversation was adequately had, both at the local level and by the and by the larger team. So, you know, we need to remedy that. Um, and then, uh, let's see. And and that it needs to be not just with like a Google form or something like the conversation, right? Needs to needs to be had and prep work with both of the parties or all of the parties who are gonna who are gonna be there is part of best practices. And then lastly, evaluating the success of these and the, and the follow-up, I see the implementation rubric. Um, my concern there being that the standards and rankings, I don't, I don't see like uh, necessarily descriptions in there that will ensure that we are consistently, objectively answering those questions. Um, for example, you know, do the, does the school community have a common understanding of what restorative approaches are, you know, and why they're used. Um, people are ranking things as to whether there are minimal, limited uh, uh, measures in place, moderate effectiveness, significant effectiveness. You know, if we don't have um, quantitative measurements attached to that, then we're just getting people's opinions about how things are going at their schools. Um, and additionally, is there a measure of success related to a report back from the parties who have been involved so at the central level, we do have, uh, and like you said, it's perceptual, right? It's perceptual data about how you think this went, right? And if there's future conflict. One of the questions asked earlier by another council member uh, asks us to take a look at um, how often a behavior is repeated after there's been a restorative intervention. I think that's a helpful tool, and we can certainly look at that because we do have that. I think that's critically important, and I also think you know follow up is just in general as a best practice for restorative justice is, is important, and that we need to um, be asking all the involved parties how they think it went, and that is going to be a really valuable piece of data for us. Thank you. Council Member uh, Ming, thank you so much for highlighting those um, pieces. We will come back to you with some more details around it. I know our time is, we're, is narrowing we're it. Thank tight. you yeah, so yeah. much. Um, but you bring up some components around not only the central office component for restorative justice, but the experience. Um, how people get to the experience, do I know what I'm entering into, and then the quantifiable pieces that we're talking about in terms of the data that's being collected. So if we could circle that back to council and be able to provide that Please. information, and then if we want to have a larger conversation after that, we are more than happy to do that. Thank you, Council Member. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Council Member Ming, Council Member Albernox. Thank you. I'd like to humbly request both chairs. We schedule the part two of this as soon well, as possible. Yeah, yeah. As believe soon me, as it's, possible. it's already on my okay. list. Okay. And, and, um, and just we're yeah. going to do one on the on the MCPS side, restorative justice discipline side. Just any &E and C too, and obviously anyone can join. But I, so we don't have to wait for. But I think on the C, if we want to do CEO part two, absolutely we should do that too. But on these questions. We, should, we need it. We're going to dig deeper as well. Yeah, right. yeah. And that, I was going to say the same thing. I was going to say, um, can I ask the chairs that we also do one, and it may be a joint, a triple, uh, EC, HHS, and public safety on behavioral threat assessment, please? Sure. Makes sense. Okay. And then this summer, because uh, then we'll also have data from this school year, which is obviously incomplete right now. Uh, but I, this will impact policy making decisions within MCPS for the upcoming school year. So I would. If we can do it by, by June, that would be really good. Um, and I'm not going to get to everything that I want to get to right now. But uh, And so I understand just on restorative justice practices. Um, I very much believe in the theoretical practices and construct that we've developed. And there is data uh, from jurisdictions that have implemented this with fidelity over five years um, that is very helpful. We've got three and now nine uh, people who are responsible for an entire school system. We have 
just as we do with all issues, the central office who works very hard on establishing a direction that each school is then required to follow. But how it's implemented, when it's implemented, varies tremendously within each of our schools. And so while it's obviously helpful and very informative to have members of the central office team here to report out the data that they have received from the individual schools, I'd like to request that we bring representatives that can be a representative sample of some of the schools to hear from them directly on how this is working how it and, and what needs to be changed uh, at the school and administrative level because we need to know where the rubber is hitting the road because there is confusion there is frustration and what i've heard from parents repeatedly um, from every zip code i mean this is across the entire county is how are these decisions are being made they're telling us that they're talking to people but they're not talking to me they're not talking to my school how do i sign up to testify what work group can i be part of and so i do have specific follow-up questions because I, I i appreciated the presentation and the attempt to hear from varied voices at all levels of this because everybody's a stakeholder here from parents to students to teachers to faculty to staff to administrators but and, and I know we're doing quantitative and qualitative, but I need to know specifically how many people have been involved in the development of this wonderful curriculum and uh, how can people provide input and feedback and share real life experiences, both good and bad, uh, that people are having at the school level. Um, so. I, I'm going to ask as a follow-up um, because we just don't have time to get that information right now, but I think that's an important part of this equation. Um, I know that at the beginning of the school year, because uh, we had a session about this in the fall uh, between public safety and education and culture, that there had been some challenges in hiring up our security staff. Um, I'd like to know where we are on the hiring of our security staff. How many security officers are there within each of our schools? Do we have that those numbers? So in our middle schools, um, all of our security officers are in our secondary schools. In our middle schools, we have about two in each school. We have a few schools that have three. In our high schools, it can range anywhere between five to eight. One of the things that we are doing this year is we are looking at how we allocate additional security staff to schools. We have not done that um, in, a, in a way since we've come back from the pandemic to really think about the needs of our different locations. So we've gathered some feedback from our administrators as well as our security staff to be able to think about how to approach it in a different way with the consideration around square footage, complexity of the footprint of the building, and then really thinking about the serious incidents and or the different programs. So we're going through that process now and I'll be able to kind of at that point really look at the staffing across the board to see if it matches the needs that we see at this moment. But that's about the average that we have. We have done very well in terms of hires for this year for our security. Um, any given time, we may be between zero vacancies, and I think the most that we had was seven, but that's because people were moving between different schools. We've been very fortunate to have some security substitutes, which we have not had in the past, where we have about a pool of seven to eight that we are able to deploy to locations if we have someone out. So we really have worked hard at that. Um, and now that second component is how do we resource appropriately? Um, and we can't do that without really being honest and being transparent about what's actually happening on a daily basis. Thank you. I, uh, I'll follow up with specific questions on exactly where the numbers are, but I, I appreciate that overview. Um, so last year, um, the 2021 to 2022 data indicates that of um, the suspensions, there were 1,500 fights that resulted in a suspension. Um, so I'd be curious as to um, how that connects to the 2018-2019 school year, because that was the last year that we were fully, um, you know, had, a, had what, what would, could be called a regular school year. And I know that the calls for service have gone down from last year to this year, um, directly originated from the schools themselves. Um, but there are 11,000 calls for service, and as Councilmember Jawando noted, um, from everybody else that called the various numbers, uh, which could have been a student, could have been a parent, could have been a teacher. 
And so I'd be curious as to how that 11,000 compares to 21 to 22, and I'd also be curious as to how that compares to 2008, 2019. Again, once again, our last full year of data um, when before COVID. And I don't need those answers right now, but that's, I think, going to be an important follow-up. And then I have a lot of questions, and we're not going to get to very many of them right now, on how and when the security officers communicate and engage with the CEO. So, and one of my concerns when we made this transition, and I can speak about this in the first person as, the, as a former youth development worker myself, but also as the former director of the recreation department, that when there were incidences in which a young person was being extorted, when a young person was being bullied to the level of uh, not wanting to come to school at all or wanting to just move out of the community, when there were gang-involved situations in which somebody's life was in threat, um, or when they were somebody was trying to sell them drugs. Um, very often, um, students in those very serious circumstances would often speak to the SRO uh, within their school who they felt comfortable working with. But in the transition from the program to CEO uh, point one and point two, the, that communication is supposed to happen to the security guard or somebody else within the school who then refers to the CEO uh, when an incident may occur. It's an important preventative step um, before something completely falls out of control. So as a follow-up in our next session, I'll have questions uh, about, and we'll send them in advance, exactly what the protocols are and how many referrals have security officers made to CEOs. Um, and how many of those referrals from the CEO have then resulted in uh, intervening in a case before that spiraled out of control? So that is um, a, a component that I think is something we need to take into account. And I agree with needing the demographic breakdown completely of the arrest. The arrest numbers are down. Um, we'll follow up. We don't, we don't have to talk about it now because we still have to get to the bus safety uh, information um, but you know as was noted earlier uh, by Councilmember Ludke um, the nature of those arrests are important to know as well uh, whether it is second-degree assault whether it is um, you know what, what were the nature of those arrests um, I think is is valuable information and if there's a way we could specifically break those down and the other issue that I'm, I'm deeply concerned about is social media. Who's tracking it? Um, where, because the, the cyberbullying that's happening on those sites continues to happen, um, and we are still seeing fights that then are posted the same day, uh, and how many, you know, encouraging how many likes for those fights, and sometimes I, I wonder if that's the origin of the fight to begin with, um, sort of a warped sense of trying to become popular. Um, and so, and it is something that we are behind, all of us, these, my, myself as a parent of soon to be two teenagers, um, am way behind on this. And so I, I'd be curious as to how that relates to both the restorative justice practices, but also um, how we are tracking that information, acknowledging it's impossible for the schools to be all things to all people. But for better or worse, they are often in the best position uh, to have information that others, and especially parents, need to know about. So. I think that's um, important to know. And so these are all questions and thoughts uh, and statements for now. Um, but we obviously have to follow up on all of this to figure out where all of this is going um, and what more we can do. And the bathroom issue, I know some strides have been made, and but it continues to be an issue um, that we're hearing from parents and students about. Um, and I know that we've try to identify dedicated security guards who are um, intervening uh, more often, um, but things like taking the doors out of stalls as part of the solution is, is um, not a solution. Uh, and so, um, and, and leading to other challenges and problems that are, are obviously very disruptive to everyone. And then lastly, um, I do want to make sure teachers are very much a part of of, of this conversation. Um, they have a wealth of information that will be helpful to us in what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what's working, what's not working. Um, and 
I think we all need to be more intentional about including their voice in these conversations. Uh, I know it's hard because uh, not, you know, just having one, it, it, it's finding a representative sample in every school is so different, all 210 of them uh, with different needs and, and different factors. Um, but I just, I want to hear more from the folks that are on the ground who are experiencing, who are seeing this every day. Um, I think that would be helpful to all of us. So with that, I'll yield back to both chairs, but there's a lot to follow up on here. Thank well, you. thank you very much. And um, we look forward to getting the additional information. Uh, we, uh, 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 Chair Juwando and I, and it would also be Chair uh, Albernaz, uh, if we have the triple committee, and I have a feeling we're going to have that, um, uh, as much time as you, as, as soon as you can get us the information, then we can uh, try to get a scheduling together in before June if possible. Um, by doing a triple committee, the only person we're actually adding is council member sales yeah. because <laughs> both uh, Chair uh, Albernaz and, and council member Lukey are on HHS as well. Um, and I do think that we, uh, as soon as we can get the, the data and the additional information, that it would be helpful to all of us so that we can understand what we do and what we don't have. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Schwann. Thank you. Thank you, Chair uh, Katz. And I appreciate all the information. And staff, are you clear on the follow-ups? Okay. I just want to make sure that on uh, the request for arrest data by race and ethnicity and, and uh, students with disabilities, also for referrals. For the DJS referrals, you know, the, the question, we, sh we should have that as well. We, we already have it. We, we get it to Susan. Okay. I'm yeah. not quite sure how it got left out of the packet, but. We'll no, I know you it. have it. It's just we, a better. Yep. Yeah. That's no yep. big deal. And just for MCPS, too, like when we come back to this, like going through that and you all pre going through that and then what a referral is and what an arrest is for, the levels, all the questions that have been asked by various colleagues, that's going to be really important when we come back. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Uh, I think some of you are staying, some of you are whoever is the school's bus safety, so we're going to move to that portion. Um, for, so I know the police department folks might have a couple of additional, and then whoever's correct for MCPS. All right, and uh, if everyone, if the new folks could just introduce themselves, and then we'll turn to staff and jump right in. <laughs> Start with you, sir. Okay. Press the button to your right. There, there you go. Uh, good morning, uh, Gregory Soloy, Director for Department of Transportation. Great, wonderful. Uh, Captain Dissel, I think. He, he introduced himself. You already introduced yourself, okay. I think, before you got asked this. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Before you threw you out of there. Yeah. Um, and you introduced yourself as well. All right. Uh, Ms. McGuire, do you want to kick us off? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, just briefly, what we have provided in the packet, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, uh, some overview data that was received from the uh, police department regarding the um, violation data for the current school year. Um, just to take a step back, this is a program that um, has been uh, jointly operated between MCPS and the police department for a number of years. The police department is required under state law to um, review the citations that are captured and the cameras, of course, are installed on the school buses. Um, the, ca ca the camera systems are on the external and internal uh, interior of the buses. Uh, and there are some diagrams in your packet regarding um, there are different uh, rules for stopping at different kinds of roads, primarily if there's a hard uh, median. There are some diagrams about where the passage and the violation occurs and how those are captured. Just to highlight also, there's a little background in your packet regarding um, the fines, which currently stand at $250 per violation. I would note that, uh, that that's for a camera violation. If a police officer pulls over an individual, that fine can be significantly higher and does involve points on your license. Um, just again to, to emphasize the, the seriousness of these violations and, and the public safety um, considerations. Um, <clears throat> so again, we do have incident reports um, for the school year, for last school year, for the current school year to date. And then also um, police did provide the top number of violations for the top five sites that received the most violations. They are by 
and large um, the same between the two years with one with one difference. Um, and I just would comment on a couple of things. One, it does appear that we're on track to have fewer violations this year if the, everything continues at the same pace. So it may be useful to hear what factors um, our agencies feel may be responsible for that. Um, also, these are very um, multi-lane, high volume um, roads. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so it may also be useful to, I'm sorry, the the road areas, the stops that are identified as the highest violations are occurring on very um, multi-lane and high capacity roads. It may be useful to discuss whether there are other areas that maybe don't receive as many violations but still are of high concern due to other factors. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. And I think you, you pointed out two things I was going to raise and before I turn to my co-chair and then I want to hear from obviously our police department partners to hear some of those answers. That knock on wood, literally, we haven't had any pedestrian involved incidences with a bus this this year. I knocked, mm -hmm. I knocked, and I'm saying it's not like a free throw. Yeah, yeah. It's not It's not the same thing. It's a good thing. And uh, we want to see that continue to happen. And then you also mentioned, Mr. Guire, that the nexus of that between that violations are down. So you one could assume that maybe the program is working. Uh, I, I would, that's what I took from it, but I want to hear from our, our partners. Um, and and then also just to frame, there was a mention in the previous conversation about the 162 incidences that happened on a bus as far as safety, because obviously when we talk about bus safety, we're not just talking about external, uh, external. we're talking about internal. Um, and we want our kids, you know, as, as someone who puts their kids on the bus every day, I, we all want them to be safe, and, and I certainly do too. Uh, so we, the context of this conversation can touch on that as well. And I'll have some questions around that. But I wanted to turn to our police department to give any overview or uh, context that they thought was appropriate. I'll just give a couple of statements before I turn it over to Chris Chippery, who is the director of our automated traffic enforcement, who really is a subject matter expert. But just for this data, one thing that is important to note is when we have the number of school bus related incidents in terms of accidents, this data is school bus category only. So it could be that there are some buses involved that are private buses. So chances are those numbers are a little bit lower because we don't have any way of capturing the data, whether it's an MCPS owned bus or a privately owned bus. So that's important to note. The second thing is, I just want to set the record straight. We did have one incident involving school buses this year. Day two of the school year, we had a seven or eight year old who was tragically run over by someone who violated the school bus warning and um, and subsequently we learned through the investigation that that driver was a spanish-speaking driver and in the same graph that you see depicted here on the walls and when you're required to stop we put that out through our pio office in spanish as well to make sure we got that segment of the community as well so i'll turn it over to uh, chris tipper on some of the data good morning uh, as you stated before, it is working. The program is working. We are on track for uh, issuing uh, less citations this year than in previous years. Of course, the lull was uh, during the COVID years when we reduced, issued significantly less citations. Um, it should be noted that 91% of the individuals that receive an automated citation uh, only receive one. You know, that, that $250 fine is, is uh, a good hit and it definitely brings education to light. Um, so that's roughly 8% are what we're looking at for recidivism. So in, in that aspect, I think the camp program is working well. Uh, I know DOT is wrapping up their analysis on the 10 uh, top locations for uh, citation issuance to offer their opinion as to if any improvements could be made to those locations. Um, that, uh, I assume that would be wrapped up in the next month or so. Thank you. Um, anything from the school system side? We would just say that, um, you know, of our 1,400 buses, we have a non-camera system on those buses that take care of the internal and external. It does create a sense of comfort for families and for students, should we ever need to use them, especially the ones internally. So, you know, we see it as a plus for us to continue um, to, with the program, and we are appreciative of the decrease for a variety of reasons that have been coming forward this year. Anything to add? You know, just to mention with the uh, interior cameras, uh, that was strictly uh, 
kind of a, a free option for us with the bus patrol contract. You have the outside cameras which capture the license plate of the, the violator and the internal cameras were provided through bus patrol and we use those on average 25 to 30 times per week with requests from schools, uh, MCPS, uh, MCPD for any incidents that happen in or around the bus. And it's just a, it's an invaluable tool. I appreciate that. I'm going to uh, hold on my question since I didn't acknowledge my co-chair and see, let him go first. But I think this is a, a great example of automation helping uh, with enforcement. Those numbers, I mean, I don't think of, I can't think of a program we evaluate where you, that type of level of recidivism, 91% only receive one ticket. Uh, that's, that's really high. But, and, and thank you, but we had to raise, or the state had to raise the amount of fine before people started to realize that this was serious. Yeah. I mean, so it, it took a while to, to get the, the good information out there. I, I can tell you that I, and I don't remember what year it was now, but we had a discussion like this at, at County Council, and that next day I was driving back here and a car went past a school bus with its arm out and thank goodness nobody got hurt but your heart is in your mouth you realize that there's a child getting ready to get on that bus and it, it is a scary thing and I'm uh, most appreciative that that uh, that we do have this automated situation um, and, and it is important for the the external part and in the internal uh, safety as well do you have any idea how many incidents that don't get to the degree that you see it on on a camera, but a school patrol um, has some sort of a report? Do you know of how, how that works? Can you, can you clarify your question for me, please? It, it was way back when, 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 when uh, buses were cold driven when I was in school um, um, they, they, they would have a school safety patrol on okay. the bus I see I see Ed yes. Clark shaking his head he remembers way back when yeah 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 so any and so do they still have a school safety patrol on a bus no at this point we don't have our school safety okay. patrol on a bus they do meet some of the buses in the elementary school they are usually outside and or in the building as the children are coming in and as they're leaving but they're not permanent members of the bus and on active duty okay so all of the reports would be either the bus driver says by the way that student had an issue today or you see it on camera the bus driver, um, sometimes a parent may contact the school to let us know, um, and or their, their students. Students come in and they share that they have concerns. So there are three entry points. Okay. Um, we utilize the internal cameras if there's a question or concern or something that we need to look deeper into. Thank you. Can I add one thing on, on the bus Please. patrol piece? So I'm relatively new to the public school world uh, this past August. And we had this conversation uh, with our NDSE conference uh, a few months ago. And first I heard of it, this bus patrol program. And a lot of districts or a lot of directors do not like it simply because it puts too much authority in the person who is being the bus patrol. And it kind of goes to their head a little bit and it causes friction between the parents and then the students. And it just, it actually causes more problems than it solves. I, I can appreciate that. I, it just that was always the way it was done. There was people who were uh, in school patrols who, in, who did the for the walkers and people who did it for the bus the buses. So, um, and, and I'll turn back. I thank you, Councilor Cass. Of course, was did not have that authority to go to his head. He was very judicious. I, I was a, when I was a school patrol. I was a school patrol where there was a walk light. I was I was a political appointee way back when. So, yeah. Many years of public yeah, service. Yes. <laughs> um, I've got my gift, retirement gift, already ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. go. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm just going to two quick questions, and I turn to Councilmember Lukey next, and then Councilmember Katz. I mean, Councilmember Alvarez. Um, the how are we doing with the bus driver shortage, um, and are, how, where are we at with that right now? So we are actually doing tremendous. Uh, we have an incredibly dedicated staff. Uh, at the beginning of the year was a little rough. Uh, we were having our admin staff, uh, my assistant director, driving uh, just to you know meet the needs. As of the end of January, we are at a point where we're fully staffed. 
we don't have that spare ratio that we want at each depot, but we're able to cover every run. And you know, just quick numbers, for example, as of March 20th, today, 146 days of school that we provide transportation for, uh, that comes out to 180,864 schedules that we ran. Cumulatively, we've only had to cancel 137. Out of 100 and how many thousand? Out of 180,000. 137 right. routes canceled out of 180,000. That's pretty good. It, it's an incredible staff we have, and yeah. it just shows the dedication we have. That's great to hear. I know that was a big issue. And Council Member Jawanda, yeah. I just want to add that we have not had any interrupted service since the beginning of February. So we have put every route on the road because, as Mr. Saloy said, we have zero vacancies at this point. That's great. And then the training, the second question, and then I'll, I'll pass it on, is the training as you bring these new folks on. We talked about the internal safety, obviously, but the driver is a key point for managing the bus along with the assistant if there, there's one, but also just their ability to drive and their train, but also managing the social aspects of what happens on a bus. Could you talk just a little bit about the training program and how and how that's going and if you're are you able to do you have what you need there and and we've had some incidences obviously bus drivers like anyone are human beings and there's some people that do things that we don't want them to do mm -hmm. but i think i know many parents want to hear about what are we doing on a front end precautionary there are two components to their training as we know the technical piece how do you drive a bus how do you get your cdl what are the things that you need to do in a safe manner to transport students to and fro and then there's the second piece um, we say the bus is the first classroom for students and so it's that bus management who are you driving how do you get to know them and how do they get to know you and so we have seen that as a, as a gap that we definitely need to fill and so we will be taking time and we've given some information to our bus, bus operators as well as our bus aides but next month we will offer a, a half day professional development session led by some of our bus operators as well as our staff um, in the equity unit to be able to support the needs of our bus drivers within that area um, how to deal um, when you may have a situation on the bus, how do you build relationships with students and families? Because many of our bus drivers see the families as they're picking up students. And then we'll continue to build off of that for the rest of the year and we'll offer some sessions in between their runs in the morning and the afternoon. What we've recognized is, it, is that we missed the opportunity at the beginning of the year. And so as we get ready for next year, we will put it in on the front end and then continue to be attentive to it throughout the year. But if that's the kid's first classroom and I'm going to make the day, um, and I'm really looking in someone's eyes to see how they're doing and how they can get into the building and learn, we want our bus drivers definitely equipped and they've asked for this and we want to be able to deliver. I appreciate that. I, I I can attest, depending on who the driver is, and my kids love their morning driver. They love all their drivers, but they really love their morning driver. And uh, it can start off the day either bad or good if there's a, someone else on that bus. Uh, Council Member Lukey. I was laughing when you were talking about the safety patrols because my youngest is one, but not on the bus because that's not a thing. Um, but they, they do still have safeties in the elementary schools. And he came home one day off the bus and he goes, Ugh. I said, what's wrong? Those fourth graders, they just don't listen. And I said, well, you're only in fifth grade, so, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? Yeah, big man on campus. Um, so the raised fines was a big support, adding points for, for repeat offenders, right, on, on the school bus violations that they can now get points on their license. Yep. No, only if an if a officer observed. Uh, only if auto, an officer observed, so not the for the uh, automated citation. Correct. Okay, um, and there was a public safety uh, announcement that was done at the start of the 2019-2020 school year and then it was played, it was on the local media and it was also played at all MVA locations around the state, um, uh, which I think was helpful to educate people about that issue. Um, how many kids are on the bus on average, on each bus, which is its own little ecosystem? That's a tough one. Uh, you know, so we have the single student uh, special needs buses going around. Uh, we have some that go out. We'll put 65 kids on one bus at one stop. Okay. Uh, I would have to say, on average, on a regular education bus is 35 to 40. Okay. Per bus. Um, and then there's some, of course, that are maxed out. And, right, right. And, of course, it varies by day because yeah. they don't always, you know, 
especially the middle schoolers. I've noticed a lot of uh, late arrivals uh, at, at, at the middle school. Um, there are the cameras on the bus do not have audio. Is that correct? No, they have full audio. Oh, they do have full audio. Okay. Um, and so inside the student handbook or the student code of conduct, um, is there a statement that advises that the cameras are there and audio recording may occur on the buses? I will have to check on that in terms of just that statement that you're speaking of okay. in our student code of conduct. So if I can do a follow up, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is because the state's wiretapping statute requires a two party consent for audio plus video recording, but for video only, that consent's not required. So you would have to give notice that that would be occurring or that that could occur. Um, and I think that was it. All right. Oh, no, one more question. Councilmember Jawando asked about uh, the staffing and the bus routes. And um, I know that the only student athletes who get buses after school to games are the football team and the boys basketball team. So is there any plan to um, increase the capacity or ability to provide um, student athletes uh, transport to away games, at least taking them over, even if parents can pick them up on the way back, because that kind of creates a bit of an equity issue if student athletes don't have a parent who can drive them to their away games. A lot of it is dependent on the time frame of the games. So we have the blackout portions of the day when we have, you know, bringing kids to school and then, of course, in the afternoon and bringing them home. Uh, I will have to dig into this to figure out exactly what we have or if you have more. It's a conversation that we continue to have, and you did highlight the component around the equity issue. We mm -hmm. work very closely with our athletics department, um, recognizing that, um, like you said, football, basketball, those are our main ones. But we do offer transportation services for some of our other athletic opportunities as well. But this is an ongoing conversation that we've okay. had this year. Thank you. I appreciate it. We yield back. Thank you, Councilor Rodas. Thanks. So obviously, those of us that were on the previous council have been tracking this since its inception, and it we, we have made great strides. There were some issues with contracts right out of the gates, and there was some issue with the technology right out of the gates. But it it seems clear from the data that those issues have been smoothed out, uh, which is uh, r really good news. Um, there was something that we had talked about when this was initially implemented, and the technology may not be there, but there was some discussion initially about with Waze and with uh, Google Maps, um, if the technology were such that it could let drivers know um, that a bus stop or a bus was stopped to ping them, uh, to let them know that was happening. Because what's happening now, people are using Waze and Google to get all around the area because streets are closed and there's all sorts of issues. And so uh, people get out of their cycle of pattern and, and that could lead to more challenges. Is the technology there? Does anybody know? Um, or is this something we could follow up with the uh, contractors on and see if this is something we could explore, or even be a pilot site? I can follow up with the contractors. I know that there's a geo, um, a GPS location is formed when the bus is as it's traveling. Um, as far as the notification as to when it stopped, no, it usually pings to the closest uh, street address. Um, and that's where we pay some of the the day that we pull for citation issuance. Thank you. And I know this happens year-round, but uh, an assessment is made of the actual bus stops themselves, and adjustments are made as necessary, you know, depending on what's happening on the ground. Um, but just could you describe a little bit, just from 30,000 feet, what that process looks like um, in evaluation of bus stops? Sure. So we, some of it comes from input from the community. They say, okay, we don't like this here. It's unsafe. However, it is. so we, we investigated out of that piece. Uh, we're in the process right now of doing route reviews for each depot, which each cluster, uh, and determining if it's feasible, if we should be at that location. Um, I actually got an email the other day from a, a parent or a former teacher about a stop on Rockville Pike. The problem we have it on Rockville Pike is because the bus cannot go into the community to turn around safely. And I believe there's about 37 kids that get on that one stop. So it has to be at that location. And same thing with in Gaithersburg with the mobile home uh, park. There's 65 children that get on that one stop and the bus cannot go into the mobile home park. So we look at all the variables with it and determine, you know, is it safe or is it not safe? 
uh, we take a lot of input again from the community saying we don't want this here is there anything else that we can do with it uh, things change of course kids graduate kids go to other schools so we may have to eliminate that stop and it may become a moot issue so that's how we look into that piece uh, with determine if it's safe or not and but it's, it's a thorough investigation we really look at it and determine you know we treat it as our own kids right that's helpful and what's the best way for parents to notify you all that there is a concern that I would assume it would be through their individual school and then that communicated it, how, how how should they do that so so the principals get a hold of us mm -hmm. and we find out about it that way from the community as well as on the transportation page uh, of the website there's the email and they can just send it right in and mine's on there so it's I, I get pinged quite a bit and which is fine great that's it thank you it's okay if you councilman make Hi, thank you. It's great to see all the improvements that have been made. Um, just wanted to check, uh, clarify the, um, now that we have all the routes covered, are those, the, um, if I recall, some routes had been combined and there were adjustments made. Um, is there, are there plans to, you know, uncombine any of those still? Has all of that been done already or how does that play in? So we do still have a few double backs. Uh, there are still late buses. It's kind of unavoidable right now. Uh, once we get that spare ratio in there, we can add or separate those routes that we combined and we'll have those individually uh, and then some of it is just looking at the efficiency of the routes that we had were they you know doing three circles to get to the same stop and you know was that causing the lateness or anything like that so we're looking into that and kind of on the efficiency where do we really need 1230 schedules every single day or is it just we, we got to that point and it's become a habit so we want to look at you know efficiencies that we can eliminate some of those and may i just add very quickly i know our time is coming to an end as we talk about post-covid we have to look at a post-covid transportation system and so as we examined our routes this year and collapsed them to really make strides to get every child to school what we also have to think about is operational efficiency and if we were going to the exact places that we needed to go to. Communities have been built that weren't there before that may have increased traffic patterns and we want to be able to be considerate of that. One other component that we are looking into and that we're in the process of really tr trying to find is an online routing system and a bus tracking app for our families and students to be able to have. That's a post-COVID move for us, and I know many other systems made it pre-COVID, but for right now, in terms of what we're doing, we're really trying to determine have what we has, um, if what we d did in the past is really matched for right now in terms of the number of children that we move, how we move them to and fro, and based on just how the county is really formatted at this particular time. So we'll continue to go through this exercise this year and then in preparation for the summer and really working to be able to, to provide the best operations as, uh, as we can. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you, we can track a lot of things, and so it makes sense to, whether it's Councilor Albanos's point about the GPS capability, um, but also being able to know where your bus is and track if it's late or make that 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 parent decision of what do I need to do. You know, a lot of the bus operators will call uh, if they have you know they exchange it from, but that's not really a formal, you know, it's not a formal protocol. But I know that's what they do to try to tell, hey, I'm going to be 30 minutes late, my bus, you know, that kind of thing. So. I think that would be very helpful. A uh, quick, question, quick question for MCPS. Um, I'll turn to my co-chair if he has any closing questions. Uh, the seatbelt program. In 1920, there was a discussion that we were going to move in the move all of our school buses into seatbelts as they naturally aged out. Obviously, we've we've got the we're, we're, and so where are we with that, and what's the timeline? So as of two, 2019, they were mandated on the build, uh, on the buses. Right now we have, I believe, 278 that have seatbelts on them. And any new bus that comes in, is it's mandated that they're in the, they're spec'd out to have the seatbelts. And that's out of how many buses? Uh, right now we have 1406. So what's the, what will be the, what's the life cycle? So give us, this, is that a 10, or what's the years? Usually a 10 year depreciation on the bus. Yeah. Uh, the electric buses we have are 12 years, uh, but they all have them anyway. So, right. depending on what we cycle through each year, 
Uh, we're doing 120 right now for 23 and 24. Uh, As part of our move to electric buses as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When we will be completely seat belt. I. Quick math, I can't give it to you. That's all right, but you gave me a sense. 120, 10 year, but life cycle, we could we could figure it, it out. Be, yeah. Like so, we're like two. I believe it's 278 right now that we have okay. that have the seat belts. Thank you, I appreciate that. And then just on the 162 incidences on the bus, I want to make sure this was clear for the previous kind of conversation. We don't, I'd also like us to have a breakdown of what those incidences were. I think we said that, but I just wanted to say it here again, just in case. Um, and then to our police department, my last question: the top five locations which have been consistent from the last couple of years. What are what are we, while the overall program is very successful, we obviously have a concentration, these are busy roads. It, it, can you tell us anything about what you're doing there or what you're noticing that to improve? Sure, I'll, I'll start and then I'll let Captain Dillman chime in, but I had three things to say and that was one of them. Um, anytime we get information data driven on accidents around a bus stop or a route in particular, a hundred could be a hundred block of a certain road, we have Central Motors who are uh, asked during the times that they're in that district, either at pickup or drop off, um, to circulate those particular high incident areas uh, for bus accidents or infractions. Um, they also coordinate with the district commanders because um, the Central guys, there's only 26 of them. Uh, we ask the, the um, district commanders to have their patrol officers step up patrols at, during those times as well. Um, one of the and that I think that was for your question. Yeah, please go on. Um, yes, yeah. sure. Uh, for Council Member Ludke, she asked about ridership at one point. Um, what we noticed uh, coming right out of the pandemic and even into the early part of this year, um, we were led to believe because um, there was an exponential increase for the amount of the request for crossing guards where we didn't have them before. Um, a lot of parents were saying they uh, were not riding the bus for one reason or another. Um, so we saw that increase. We've seen it drop off a little bit. And at one point, we were at a uh, crisis for the amount of crossing guards we had. We're doing a lot better now. So it's kind of leveled out. Um, and then lastly, the uh, one of you all mentioned how do uh, we get information about incidents. A lot of times that comes from the CEOs even still. Um, they'll notice uh, a, a problem on a certain route or with a traffic pattern or from a feedback from a student or a teacher or the school administration, and uh, we'll address it that way so we get feedback from the CEOs as well. Appreciate that. Um, yes. And just to note, um, Chris does a fantastic job. School Patrol gives a monthly printout to them of the top locations, so we don't have to wait for a year to determine these numbers we can get them monthly. And then, like uh, Chief Yamada said, I then will then put that out to our supervisor or central traffic unit, as well as our district commanders and the district traffic complaint officers that they can also look into those locations. That's great. It's great to know, is that coordination? Councilman Katz. And very quickly, if, you, if there is an area where the school bus, you've seen more than, you know, uh, uh, more than a couple uh, citations being issued. Does anybody look at whether or not there could be a sight distance problem or something that maybe if you move the the uh, bus stop a uh, half a block down or whatever, that it would be a safer situation so that you that that a driver I mean, sometimes the driver means to do the right thing that didn't see the school bus, you know, type of thing. To the last minute. So we were talking about the percentage earlier as I was walking in on what gets dismissed. So. The citations are viewed by MCPD and to determine whether or not they're valid. Mm -hmm. And I, I forget if you could remember or the percentage that's actually dismissed. Uh, we, we usually, on average, with with what we're sent over by the contractor, we dismiss av on average between 51 and 55 percent of the citations they sent over. Um, as some type of action that the driver wasn't able to stop within a reasonable amount of time, we'll dismiss. We also get the top five reasons why we dismiss the citation uh, on a monthly basis from the contract company. But do you then go back and look at that, that the spot where the bus stop was located, if you moved it, whether or not it would be in a safer situation for the 
student living on the bus and the driver? Not from an enforcement side. That's what DOT's uh, report on the top 10 locations are supposed to come out with their recommendations as to uh, what could possibly be done to mediate some of those excessive citation locations. I would strongly suggest that you, you do that. It's during during the raw reviews, we do that. Just example, we have the list of the right. top violations, you know, with the fines collected and from back to 2019. So that's all taken into consideration when we do the actual route reviews. Okay, is this in a, because if they're getting so many violations there, is it safe for the kids? Right. So that's all taken into consideration. That's my point. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and one thing to add that I think is important is a lot of these top locations are multi-lane and it's an education piece. So we constantly are getting us out to educate the public as to when you have a multi-lane yeah. highway, right. when is it that you need to stop and, and when is it that you don't. Right. So. Yeah. And in the event it results in an accident, an unfortunate collision, um, there is follow-up done with as, as either SHA or DOT on design, you know, issues that might be, have played a part in the accident. Thank you very much. Sorry. Yes, okay, sir. We're also tracking um, House Bill 849, yeah. which started out as MC123, which just cleared uh, environment and transportation. It's moving on to the Senate, and that requires um, the first issuance of a citation on a divided roadway. I'm sorry on an undivided roadway to be a warning on the first issuance. So I know when I, I came in front of the council before that was a concern and it's it's still moving forward we're still at the same concern. And, and I think we sent a position saying we don't support that um, and I think the data here bears that out. This is working um, and we're having not only fewer violations but we're having less incidents or crashes and, and, and that's what you want. So. Um, and I think it's important <laughs> we bury the lead because we do get concern from residents. You just kind of calmly said you dismiss 50 plus percent right. of the violations, right? And so we're doing a careful job on the back end too of, because we, I, as I said, when we when it get, said we didn't like that bill, we are erring on the side of safety here as far as we don't want anyone to pass a school bus. and. But obviously, there are situations where it's impossible to stop, and you're and you all are taking that into account and in, in clearing fifty plus percent of those. Did I hear that correctly? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's on that's on an average. Um, some months are higher than others. Yeah. If I can just add one other thing, so on um, part of the HBO eight four nine, the law that they're trying to amend. If you look at the violations issued, seventy one percent of the violations issued last year were on the multi-lane roads and these are the exact ones that he, they want to eliminate in this bill right and it's so that's that's my biggest concern yes yeah. yeah um i i appreciate that and uh we'll, we'll track that and we'll make sure we look look into that um, if there are no other comments um appreciate all the work you're doing we'll get a lot to follow up on in both on the other conversation as well but with that we're adjourned thank you mm -hmm.